Welcome back, everyone. Uh, yeah, that's a little something Okay, we had a fantastic launch. Was it good? Okay. You know, you know what? You know what? <laughs> You know what, right? <laughs> you know what, right? Um, uh, I remember when we were planning this event, um, uh, we were considering what should we offer in terms of the venue. Should we have pound a gown? Uh, okay, all right. So I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The next year, I promise you, I'm going to catch a lot. I'm sorry. I'm from, from the guys of Ghana, from KK, and I'm from Apu. Yeah? Okay, fantastic. fantastic. Thank you very much uh, uh, for, for joining again and for us uh, attendees on. We're now in the second session, the PF session for uh, today's conference. I mean, I've been looking forward to this topic. So I'm hoping that everybody here also would like to learn about this issue. Promotion is a big problem for many of us as black academics in UK. And uh, it's my pleasure to welcome on stage today Professor Chidi Berry Ogonaya. Professor Chidi Berry Ogonaya is a professor of human resource management. At the University of Kent. He's also the associate editor for uh, Human Relations, a four star journal of agencies, and also uh, Financial Times 50 journal. So he's a big man. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So Buna is also the head of the department, current head of the department uh, at the uh, University of Kent School of Business, head of the department of management. Leadership and, Leadership and management. So it's really good to have you here. I also want to welcome Dr. Ola Jumoke, who she likes to call herself Jumi. Yeah. Right. Dr. Ola Jumoke Okoya, who is the academic director. I know you is in the annotated um, interim dean. Interim dean for Office for Institutional Equity. Office for Institutional Equity. Office for in, in, Institutional Equity. I'm really sorry. I apologize. At the University of East London, it's a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you. Yeah, I'm interviewing Dean. That's a big group. Okay. And and tell you, the speaker we have here today, all the way from Liverpool. Right. Thank you. Now the appeal pronunciation. Right. Right. We've got Charlie West, the professor of finance, and. He's joining us all the way from Liverpool. He's also heavily involved in um, uh, a lot of industry work with financial experts. We'll talk a bit, a bit more about that <laughs> in this session. Which is welcome. Finally, uh, a member of the house, <laughs> and uh, my very good friend and colleague, Dr. Francis Deluxe, uh, who's an associate professor of entrepreneurship. Here at the University of Denson School of Business. Thank you. Thank you and good afternoon to you all. Uh, welcome back. Um, official or unofficial, this is the hottest topic, uh, the kind of topic that keeps all of us awake every day. And I hope you've had enough uh, energy from the lunch to keep us awake uh, for this session. Um, I think from what I've seen from the previous session at the end, that is okay. We may limit the uh, questions from me a little bit, and I will give the audience a lot of time to ask questions, considering this is one of the hottest topics everybody is really interested in. Would that be okay, Adi? Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, I've been thinking about an icebreaker for this session too. Thank you. I've been thinking about, oh, better. I, 
I think I have an icebreaker for this session, actually, and, and I'm thinking, I, I don't need to pick on you, uh, but what I want to do is that if each of you can share with us um, the one thing, or maybe the two critical things that you did that got you the promotion or where you are at the moment. You are a professor, you are an interim dean, also another uh, professor, but what is the one thing, uh, the unique thing that you did, or if it's two, that go your current role that you are in at the moment? Like I said, I didn't mean to pick up, but I thought maybe that would be a good icebreaker. Um, if I start with you, um, Jumo. Jimmy, please. Jimmy, okay, thank you. Um, when I saw that my name was added to the session, I promised myself one thing. I said, I'm going to be brutally honest because this is something I wish someone did with me when I was younger in the career. Um, and all the things that I, I had to go through because somebody didn't tell me what I needed to know soon enough. Uh, I want to kind of spill it out. Uh, so one thing that got me to where I am, relationship, I have to say, is one thing, nurturing relationship and managing up. And secondly, constant development, constantly sharpening my sword, ready for when opportunity shows up. Um, thank you. Um, just let's start here. Thank you, Sarah. For me personally, what led me to my current position is publishing in four star journals. That's the truth. And also being willing to be mobile. Because sometimes when we talk about promoters, you do everything right, but you still don't get it. So you should be ready to move to the next player. Well, it's important you say that actually because it's on my list of questions <laughs> about whether we stay where we are, if you're comfortable or we move elsewhere, but I think we'll get to that in a bit. So, um. Hello everyone. Um, so I think for me, the most important thing was mentorship. So having a mentor, talking to my mentor and understanding the rules of the game. Um, so that was one. And the second thing I think was changing my focus changing my focus away from it's about me and thinking more about how am I contributing to my environment. So that was really important. Okay. I mean, the, the reason why I asked that question was because I wanted us to start appreciating the differences or the varieties when it comes to being promoted. It, it works differently. It's it's not like a one size fits all. I think we know that. Uh, and so I wanted us to have maybe a different view, first of all, before we can actually get to it. Um, in that regard, is there a checklist, for example? And and I, I want this to be like, a, or I want us to have it like um, a case study or things that we have lived experience of. So, and so obviously, most of you be drawing on your testimonies or things that you've been through. And I, we just want to find out, is there a checklist out there? So a bucket of lists that you have to check and check. And if you don't check that, you don't get what you're looking for. I'll just uh, continue with you, uh, Chad. Um. So when I start, so I'm just going to step back a little bit. So when I started my career, I was the crazy researcher. Right? So I was really research, research, research. And then at some point I thought, okay, I'm going to apply for this thing. And that's when I realized that there's actually a leveling guide right? that tells you what is it that you're supposed to be doing, how to evidence that. So for me, that was the first shock that I had, right? So you look at it and you're like, objectively, I don't think I take all these boxes, you know, because I haven't been preparing myself to be able to take all those boxes. So I think that's really important, but generally you assess on three criteria, right? Teaching, research and leadership. And you need to be able to show that you contribute to all these dimensions. And the further up you go, the more emphasis there is on the leadership um, side of things. So I think that's something um, that we don't necessarily think enough about. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, obviously, I don't want us to to sound like repeating ourselves, but there is a checklist, right? And, and I'm thinking, in your case, um, Jimmy, Jimmy, thank you once again. In your case, did you meet a checklist? And if you did not meet a particular checklist, what did you use to leverage that? The fact that it was a checklist that you didn't need, but you still got what you were looking for. What different thing did you do? So the first time I applied for promotion, I didn't get it. Um, Naturally, I was gutted. I was angry, I was upset, I was everything. And then I said, you know what? I think these people don't value me. I'll show them. 
So what I did was to improve my external profile. That's something I, uh, and I think you will start to have to mention that, yeah. that learn how to live in another universe, so, so not just being a pure academic. Maybe it was uh, a shady that one of you mentioned that. I said, I'm going to do something outside of academia. So I started nurturing relationship outside, uh, speaking engagement, uh, being on committees, being on board, doing things. My name was popping up everywhere. So my line manager sat me down and said, what's going on with you? So, um, some people appreciate me out. <laughs> <laughs> and he started thinking of how can I use this lady? So I would say one thing is about visibility, institutional visibility. Do people know you enough so that when your name is mentioned for a big role of a promotion, they're not saying, who's this obscure person? Who, who, who's that? So I put myself forward. Yes, it is additional work when you put yourself on committees, but putting the work in, I think somebody also mentioned that earlier today about you do that donkey work at some point, but then you ask for the value in you know what you've offered. Mm. So yes, um, to to answer that question, it's about visibility, external promoting mm. your profile externally, and also being very strategic in what you say yes to, and um, aligning to your area of research or um, specialism, for example. So all the things I did externally were aligned to gender equality, EDI, and you know and Internally, they were not recognizing that, but what I was doing outside then kind of spoke for me. So I think it's being creative in how you then, you know, manage your career and not just allowing things to happen to you. Empress. Yes, please. Yeah. So um, I'll approach this question a little bit differently. <laughs> As uh, current head of the department, I sit on the promotion committee at Kenyan Business School. So I'll give you an insight from that perspective and also from the perspective of being an external examiner for other schools whose um, candidates have applied for promotion. So yes, there is a checklist. So you have to be good at teaching, good at research, have some admin or leadership roles, show uh, evidence for citizenship, and show a record of building an international or um, an engagement profile. So these are the checklists for getting promoted at any stage of your career as, a, as an academic. However, these, the, 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 the criteria is very subjective. I've been on several promotion committee meetings where you will find someone who has, let's say, 10 ABS three publications and some members of the panel say it's not enough. At the same time, we find someone who has just four, but good leadership or good teaching grades and the committee will say that's enough. So what I'm trying to say is as much as we've got the criteria, the process is very, very subjective. And the reason I'm saying this is because the subjectivity in the promotion process affects all of us in this room, particularly the uh, minority academic. But sometimes the expectation they have for us can be greater than our non being or non-minority peers. And that's where that subjectivity becomes important because you just you get you get expected to work ten times work ten, ten times harder than a non-minority uh, colleague. So I say all these things because I want to encourage us to think about the promotion as not just ticking the box, but packaging yourself. And when I, when I say packaging yourself, I mean trying to support whatever you present to the committee with strong evidence. So if you're saying you have X, Y, Z number of research publications, support that with the language of it has impact in social and social place. Mm -hmm. If you're saying I've done X, Y, Z things in teaching, package that in a way that shows your teaching makes an impact. That way you have the committee members looking at your profile like, okay, well, this is someone we want to keep, this is someone we want to give extra resources to build the overall profile of the institution. Can I can I have to that? Yes. Um, 
I really agree with what he just said. And I used to fall into the trap of writing about what I've done without showing impact. So with impact, use qualitative and quantitative evidence to support your application. And that is, um, I led four programs successfully. Um, so what happened on that program? So 98% of my students you know, passed um, over three years. 72% um, did this. So provide us quantitative so that they see that you're not just, you know, talking some, you know, gibberish or something. Yeah. Just the you know, yeah, just make sure you, you stick it very well in, you know, evidence. And also qualitative, if you can get some testimonial. So I run a lot of programs in my university. So yes, thank you, Jimmy, for those programs. But where does it lead us? So collect testimonials, show impact. It's not just running around, you know, doing things as you before you start doing it, you already think of measures that you're going to use to demonstrate impact, even for yourself um, at a personal level. If you're doing anything one to one for your school, how does it benefit me? How will I evidence it? Yeah, thank you. And, and it's interesting you touched on um, being subjective and all that. You know, when the word subjective is used, is is this kind of illusion we don't even know what it is so i can right we, you can't really touch it you can't feel it and people can play around it and all that and sometimes get away with it but the question is as people as, as we found ourselves how do we get away or get around this kind of subjectivity that surrounds it and i wanted to actually ask a question before the session started but i think i can still ask apart from those of us who are heads of group is there anyone here who sits on a promotion panel in our schools or part of an interview panel that seeks to appoint, maybe not a lecturer, but an associate professor? professor. Hmm, interesting. Um, I guess I wouldn't want to conclude, but to some extent that could be one of uh, the issue of this subjectivity and all that. But I just want us to know how do we, and, and you are head of a group, so how and, and you are an you are a professor. How do we get around this issue of subjectivity to make sure that that is not being used as the excuse uh, to deny people of their promotion? Um, yes, yes, please. Yeah, go ahead. So, um, when I say subjectivity, again, I have to emphasize I didn't say that to discourage anybody. I'm saying I said that because that's the reality of how promotions work. Um, so to answer your question, um, the way, in my view, and in my experience, the way to overcome this so-called subjectivity is number one, make sure you meet the minimum criteria. So if in, at your institution, you see the person who was promoted from lecturer to senior lecturer last year had X, Y, Z number of publications, has um, four, four, four over five teaching evaluation, you look at what the previous people had in terms of the minimum criteria. You see that you have all those things. That's the first to make sure you have the minimum, minimum, minimum criteria. Then after you've done that, the next thing is origin sets. You have to package your, your, your yourself. We have if you, if you, if in your promotion document, if you say you have, you've done excellence in teaching, what impact did it have? You have to qualify what you've achieved in a way that all six members of the panel will see that what you've done is not just uh, ticking the box, it's actually building the profile of the institution. So um, I'll close by saying this, if you want to beat the subjectivity aspect of the promotion committee discussion, you have to present your documents or your submission in a way that anyone who says no to your work is basically being trying to find the politically correct way. So, anyone, when you write your document, make sure you've written it in a way that everyone will see it and say, "Well, this is a promotable candidate." And someone who says no has a problem. Yeah. That's, I think, that's the best way to put it in a more minimal way. I have to say that I will be speaking as someone who leads a department that looks at everything from the lens of equity. And one of the problems with promotion process is 
that it is sometimes shrouded in secrecy. Uh, and some universities don't even publish the names of the people on the panel. I can't tell you how many times I've said yes to be on the interview panel just so that I can go and put my face in the matter and know who is chosen. And the fact that I show up then, everybody knows that we've got to, we've got to do it right. I want the same level of attention to a surreal appointment because right now the way it's happening is a university pick the people that they feel that would make decision based on what they tell them sometimes. They tell them we want two from this school and one from that school. This person is really appointable even before the Luca application. That shouldn't be the case because what you're doing is you're already planting your bias in the panel before they, they actually start. So what we're saying here is there should be that level of transparency that allows for meritocracy to happen and for evidence to speak for itself so that people then get chosen or appointed based on what they presented. So a review of the process is going, is going, um, is, an, is, an, is an process um, at my university, I know for sure. And that is to involve who are the people that are on the panel even the external person that, that, that are chosen, how do we appoint them? How do we choose them? And are there, you know, relationship or connection with people internally, which mean that they might want to, you know, play to what they've been, you know, prepped to do. So I think there is a lot to say yeah. in terms of making sure there is a representation of, you know, diversity on the panel yeah. and sticking to the scripts of what's the criteria yeah. and are we walking to that script? Um, anything on that? Yes, so, so I think there are a few things that we could do. Um, so one is I completely agree uh, with Trini's argument that, you know, it's also about um, looking at recent cases of promotion, um, whether it's within our, so first within our institution, because that gives us an idea of what is it that the institution actually values, right? So some institutions value more grant funding than teaching and so on, right? Um, the second thing is going to be about looking at what's happening to the wider sector as well. Mm. Right? So essentially, and I've been guilty of that, sometimes my idea of subjectivity is because I'm comparing completely different time periods, mm -hmm. right? And standards might have been going up. And so, you know, it's important to talk to those who've been recently through the process and they might even share the application document or offer feedback. Um, the other thing I was going to say is, um, you asked a really interesting question to the broader yeah. audience here about who sits on these panels, yeah. right? Um, so for those in the room who've identified these people, when you're about to make that application, reach out to these individuals and say, hey, you know, I'm applying for that title, for that position. Can you please have a look at my application pack and tell me how is it that I could actually improve that? That's the whole point of having some people sitting already on that committee. They might not be in our own area of expertise. They might not even be within our own institution, but you know, the principles uh, transcend the areas of yeah. academia, right? So the same principles apply in the private sector and so on. You need to be visible and all these things. So let's reach out to the network. Let's reach out to those people who've made it or who sit on those committees because they can provide us with valuable intel. Thank you, really. Um, yeah, for, for, for those things about getting around subjectivity. Um, one thing I've also thought about is, and uh, Chidi, you mentioned actually about mobility, being willing to or wanting to move around. Goodness me, I, I, I started my first academic job in 2019, and this is my third university. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the dean is not my head of group is not here, so I'm not in Leicester. I'm just here. Uh, but um, it's about the willingness to move. And I wanted, to, if you could share with us, some people see that as a challenge. Um, if any of you have moved recently or have been moving, what, what do you think you would tell a young academic about the issue of move, moving or being able to be mobile and move around? Because if one house doesn't want you, another house will find a home or a room for you to sleep in. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm probably the wrongest person to ask this question <laughs> because I've, I'm of a generation that comes in and stays. <laughs> so I've been at my university for about 24 years. Wow. And in that time, I've occupied several leadership roles. Um, it wasn't that I didn't have intention of 
moving or I didn't get opportunities. In fact, what I did externally kind of kept me going. So I, I'm associated with um, site business school Oxford. I do a lot of work for Cambridge. And I'm connected to several universities. So even though my substantive um, role is at the University of East London, and I've been there, but it felt like I've been at different institutions. So I've experienced different culture. I've learned different things. And that has kind of, you know, opened my eyes to so many things. And it has enriched my experience as well. So what I'm saying is, if the opportunity to go elsewhere, especially if where you are is in seven you do it. Now, I didn't do that because at a point I was raising my children. My, my university is very local to me, 20 minutes I'm there. Weekends, I'm there and it's easy for me. I'm, you know, I'm not promoting that, but it, it, it worked for me. But being flexible and agile, especially if you're young and new in your career, uh, have your eyes open everywhere uh, and, and you know, think of what serves you first uh, and think of you know, where there are better opportunities for you. So that flexibility, definitely do it. Uh, I've done it in a different way, so I didn't particularly leave my institution. I went part time at one point so that I was able to explore and experience other universities. But I think uh, it's a, a useful strategy that can really um, accelerate your career uh, if you have the appetite for that. OK, um, start by saying I am mobility is not for everyone. So that's my disclaimer. Mm -hmm. However, it was for me. Um, <clears throat> I've moved twice. My first movement wasn't for was for personal reasons. I I, I enjoy I liked where I was. I was in East Anglia. I did my PhD in East Anglia. I had wonderful colleagues. I had wonderful mentors in East Anglia. I didn't want to move. I loved the university, but I had um, personal challenges which made me move. So that was that wouldn't count towards this discussion. Well, my most recent move from, I won't mention university there, but you can Google me if you want, um, was purely promotion based. And um, the reason why I said career mobility is not for everyone, but use it if you must use it, is because um, this is a safe space, so I have to say what I have yes. to say. There is discrimination in UK higher education, yeah. point blank, that's the truth. One of the reports we have is career mobility. If your CV is of the sectoral standard and the people you're working for do not see them, do not appreciate it, use your use what you have. And that what you have is career mobility. And I, I can say something. If you use it, they'll come back for you. <laughs> that is okay. I'll give you my own story was um. I, I wasn't really keen on, on, on becoming a professor. I was just enjoying my grant applications, my research, my teaching, every aspect of academia. My dean saw what I was doing, and my dean called me for a meeting to say, Chidi, you, you are operating at a level beyond most people at that level. You need to be promoted. I was like, oh, this guy is seeing what I'm doing. I didn't even realize I was at operating at a professional level. But my dean said, you have to apply for promotion. He said, you have to. I talked to the head of the department in my previous institution and he said, but if the dean says, says that, then you, you have to apply. I said, but what's the process? He said, well, at the business school, they decide, but it goes to a second level where you have, I think, the VC and things like that. They, they, now, they, look, at, they look across the institution and decide who gets promoted. So he, my head of the department at that time said, at that stage, things could change, but definitely if the dean is saying apply, then business will definitely support you. So that's why I, I said, OK, well, since that's the case, I, I took it off. Um, I applied as I expected the business to support me 100%. But we got to the level of the second layer, I got rejected. I was, of course, uh, uh, disappointed, but what made, made it even worse was someone who could not even compare 
my sleep go to hotel. And I, 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 I went to the health department and I said, what's this? Why did, why did you guys even tell me to apply? I would have said where I was. I was in there myself. I said, no, oh, who has to speak to the dean? I went to the dean and the dean said, oh, gee, it just happened. So I'm like, it, it just happened. <laughs> so in my mind, I thought it was racial, racially, racial discrimination, racially motivated. But of course, I have no evidence. So what did I do at that stage? I used my career mobility. And at that, so during the same period, other universities were, were watching, they were seeing, it was close to the ref. They saw my profile, they saw what I was doing. Three universities, a week after I got rejected, approached me. Not like, it's not like they knew what was happening, it was just <laughs> And I was like, why would I stay here when three other universities were interested in my, in my, um, in my profile? Yeah, so anyway, I applied. I got the job two weeks after my, my promotion was rejected. I said to the dean, I'm leaving. He said, oh, Chidi, let's talk. I said, talk, what are we talking about? <laughs> And then, so, bottom line is, again, I'll just repeat myself. If it's not for you, then it's not for you. You can stay where you, where you are, but always have it at the back of your mind that you, you have power. Yes. Career mobility is power. You can use it to either move or use it to negotiate in your university. Don't disregard it. Don't say, oh, no, I don't have to apply. You can apply, but hold it and say to your team, I have this. What are you going to give me as a counter offer? Yeah. If they refuse, then you then decide to either stay or move. But if it's for you, do it. If it's not for you, then it's something. Um, yes, maybe just final word. Yes, I yeah. mean, the point about career mobility is a delicate one because I, I totally take the point that Juni makes about, you know, thinking also about the implication that this has for your family, for your personal circumstances. And most importantly, thinking about whether this is actually like a long term thing or just like a stop the gap thing. Because, mm -hmm. you know, if you're going to move, let's say, from London to Edinburgh and doing that commute over 10, 15 years, you start to feel it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's something to think about. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I would add is, you know, the career mobility thing is great. But my advice to the community would be, you know, apply first. If you get knocked back, then it's okay to move on, you know. Um, and the reason I say this is because you learn so much by applying, you know. Even that rejection, it hurts. <laughs> and you become resilient and you learn because one day you will run your own group and you have to advise the next generation <laughs> on how to write that application and so on. So it's really important in my view to go through that process. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, of course, once again, it's not a, a one size fits all, isn't it? it depends on uh, individual circumstances. And, and I mean, um, yeah, the good news is that I think our job has one of Economics 101, labor mobility. I think we happen to be one of the most mobile uh, labor groups. Uh, but then obviously, we have to look at our personal circumstances. I think I'm going to pause here and then I will go back to the audience actually, because I, I promise we're going to give them a lot of time. But just before that, I would like to pick, and again, quite unconventional, but I'd like to pick the, the thought of views of uh, Lisa, and I think, is it a um, uh, uh, Yeah, Julian, on, yeah, fortunately, have you because you sit on promotion panels or interview panels for higher appointments and all that. So if you share with us briefly, just a minute, anything that we're supposed to know that these speakers haven't shared with us yet or haven't said or any comment. Once again, apologies for picking on you, but there may be some experiences you want to share with us before we go to the audience. So, thanks. Thank you. I'm just building on policy because I said it that's okay. And one of the things that I realized is that most everybody, the uh, 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 like majority, um, Problem, but you don't understand the question that's being asked in the promotion theater. Um, and it's written for that purpose. So, one of the things I would say to you is that you have that conversation with HR about what does each section mean and how does that need to be represented. But sometimes my managers also don't know mm. about the structure of it. And it is not their fault, it's just a fact. Okay. The other thing is, um, I'm, I'm going to lean into the subjectivity, that's okay. 
The promotion criteria are clear. There should be no subjectivity whatsoever. And mm -hmm. um, so subjectivity is not a criteria mm -hmm. on the assessment. So what I say to people is you may feel that you've met the criteria, but you may not have. You, if you have not, it is your responsibility to go back to the panel and ask for feedback on every aspect of the criteria. Based on that, you will see what you need to do in whatever section. Leave the other sections alone, they're fine. Work on what's required to uplift yourselves in the two sections where you fell short. Some people just walk away. Never walk away. Ask for written feedback. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, again, Bill's in what you just said and what you just said. Um, one of the biggest problems is that when people put together their application promotion, for promotion, and I've just recently gone through the trauma of it myself, believe it's traumatic, is they don't think of, well, oh, one should think of how your story feeds into a coherent picture of where you are going. So doing a bit of this and a bit of that, if you don't tie them in together to say, this is my academic journey, I'm, I want to be professor of. Mm -hmm. But if you get to, you've got to show that you are working your way towards that, that you are working towards becoming professor of what your subject is. Um, I agree wholeheartedly with Alzian saying, in terms of the criteria are there to confuse. Um, they are so, for them, and also not coherent, they're not the same in every university. Um, and our university, by the way, is always kind of best sign about who is on the panel, always. So, uh, we're also at our university have been accused of, like I say, say, space, right? Yeah, and that was treating it, yeah. but that just sending out sort of like automatically printed feed. So the feedback, one person has been one thing, and then the actual feedback that they receive from the panel is this like also generated stuff. So I think the issue is that don't be subjective and for me, uh, uh, that's the last thing I want to say really, to me is 100% right, quantify every single thing that you do. I have taught this for so many years. I have like five master's students this year, all of whom have got A's or, you know, they love it. It's simple. It's simple. Can you use their language? Use their language. So when you're writing out any anything for promotion, you'll see three words like, oh, I've got the uh, like, um, I don't know, in, institutional citizenship. <laughs> aspiring leaders or something you're going, an aspiring leader in institutional citizenship because and as soon as they do that i can put it in bold so institutional citizenship aspiring leader and then you find the one thing that you have done or two things that you have done that time so yes yeah, speak their language don't be subjective and give them they are trying to yes <laughs> thank, thank you, you. Um, thank and please feel free to direct your question to any of them that you want. If it's an open question, I'm sure any of them can answer as well. So, um, yes, there are questions on that. So, go with that first. The first one is will teaching focus will lead to becoming a professor? Um, for the second question is for those in business school, what would you have to say about the ABS list? <laughs> okay, uh, so I'm going to start. With, so I'm going to focus on the second one. Um, so, you know, just for ease of exposition, so the ABS is, uh, generates this list of journals, right? And then they will say, oh, these are the top journals, these are the four stars, the fourth, and everything else, right? So that's done by a committee. I mean, we know who these committee members are. Um, and so a lot of universities in the past were just using that list to say, OK, um, you've published in the Journal of Finance, so this is a four star, and so that's great, right? And that's how um, we kind of assess researchers. Um, nowadays, a lot of universities are moving away from that ABS list. 
And so at most universities now, uh, you have this big reform agenda whereby you create an internal committee that they call a reading panel. So it's an internal committee of senior faculty members who are experts in their area, and they're supposed to read every single paper published by a member of staff of the group. And so they read these papers and they make their own judgment as to whether this is a four star, a four, and so on. And so, you know, the ABS, yes, you might argue that, yeah, probably they still have the ABS mapping somewhere at the back of your mind. And so that's what they, uh, they use to rank the papers. But I've, based on the evidence that I've also seen, sometimes their rankings depart quite markedly from what the ABS list is actually doing. So really the only piece of advice I can give to anyone is write the best paper that you can. Okay, don't try to be too strategic and target that journal because you know acceptance rate is a bit higher there. Write the best paper that you can because your senior colleagues are going to read those papers anyway, and they're going to make an assessment based on that. And nowadays, this is what you write on the um, application path for promotion. So you no longer say, um, I've published in this journal that is ranked as a four star. What you do write is, you know, I've published this paper and the reading panel has rated it as four star, right? So there's this big shift happening. Um, just to follow up on the theme of shift happening, um, I'm part of the group called Chartered Association of Business School Race Equity Action Group. So we are a subset of CAPS and we're currently having conversation about this ABS list and representation or lack of representation of uh, people like us uh, in terms of membership of the people who are editors and all of that. Uh, so that is going to change. Um, you may not be seeing anything yet um, happening, but there are serious conversations going on behind the scenes. Uh, and regards to the second question about um, teaching, can teaching lead to full professorship? Yes. Um, some universities make it really clear that there are two tracks and you choose your own tracks and make sure that you then uh, what was meeting the criteria that are, you know, um, outlined in that track. If it's a teaching track, as long as you meet those requirements, yes, you get the uh, full professorship. So it is a yes. So <clears throat> my views are slightly different in the sense um, the current environment we live in, particularly for business, because if you're not in a business school, then it's may not apply to you. But if you're in a UK-based business school, the CAPS list mm. is the Bible. Yeah. In the sense, the CAPS, CAPS list is endorsed by all the deans mm. in UK-based business school. Yeah. So if you want to progress in the UK business school, look at the camps. This is my own personal experience, my own personal advice. You don't have to listen, but this is, I've been on panels and they always look at, on paper we say, we don't look at the camp. We have all these EDI concerns. They say that outside, but within the panel, it will shock me to see how every member of the panel would say, how many four star, yeah. how many three star, but outside, oh, we don't, we don't look at the cars, we just look at the quality of research. That is not true. In the panel meeting, people get rejected for publishing in two star journals. So if we want to be realistic, particularly for us who are already marginalized as non minor, uh, non majority, look at what the environment says. And for us in the business schools, CAPS is the Bible. That's number one. Then, in terms of getting promoted um, on the teaching track, as you said, it's true. Every university must create a path for promotion, either you know, on the research side or the teaching side. But what I've experienced for the teaching track colleagues is that for the research colleagues, our um, our criteria tends to be more objective. So, how many grants have you got? How many papers have you published? How many uh, industry partners do you have? For the teaching side, it becomes a bit um, unclear for some panel members because um, most teaching colleagues do not have the time, the research time, the time to actually engage because their work, I manage workloads in my department. 
I can see that teaching colleagues in my department have heavy, heavy, heavy teaching loads compared to the research colleagues. So it's sort of a disadvantage for the teaching colleagues because for the research side, you have more time to do other things and get yourself promoted. Whereas for the teaching colleagues, um, because the teaching um, workload is quite high, you may not have enough time to build the portfolio that is required to get you promoted. So um, long uh, short story is yes, it's um, you can get promoted to professorship, but I think the teaching colleagues tend to be more disadvantaged compared to the research colleagues. Thank you for those wonderful answers. Um, OK, um, goodness me, where should I? Yes. And yes. Another online or? No, we face, face to face. Yeah, you should okay. bring people in the room. So we are having people on there. We have to be an advantage for coming here. Thank you. I'm Mercy Benedo. I have two questions. One of them, so Alicia said um, we should use with all means, get the oral feedback, the written feedback. The first one is what do you do when both the written feedback and the oral feedback does not elevate you, does not really make any meaningful sense to you? And when you look at the promotion benchmark, you feel you've done, you've met all these promotion criteria. And the other one is how do we challenge institutional discrimination? Is it our responsibility to do that? And if yes, what should we do as well when it comes to promotion? Um, so organically, um, we are being drafted <laughs> into the speakers. I appreciate the questions. I always make students like this. It affects me. It affects me and it's challenging. So I would say, yes, if it doesn't matter at all, there's two reasons. One, they don't understand the criteria themselves, or two, particularly their need to take. Mm. It's your responsibility as the affected person to seek clarity. That means going back again and again and again until we're all clear of what I need to do next. And um, it's a beautiful job being somebody that line manages and is responsible for other people's upliftment and the university has a duty of care to care. Thank you. Thank you. So I hope one year, one year that was set up. We can have a, an inclusive q and Yes, uh, thank you. To the panel, um, I've got two questions. Number one, uh, at the institution level, do you think there are gatekeepers to uh, promote black academics, you know. And secondly, do you have any plans moving forward, any strategy to reform the panel membership for promotion of black academics? Yes, uh, who wants to go? I'd like to speak to yes. the question about gatekeepers. Um, so. I think in the spirit of being comfortable to speak uncomfortable truths. Yes, there are gatekeepers who have jobs. Not that their job is to, you know, keep you down and not make you go forward, but in their role and in their mind, they already decide who they want to give opportunities to. I've shared this in this room. Not too long ago, and I'm saying maybe two, three years ago, my line manager said to me, I see you in six years being promoted. And I almost fell off my chair. Like, me? So I'm going to have to wait for six years to get promoted. Luckily, there was someone else in the room when I said it, uh, because that was my career coach. And she looked at me as well like, is it talking about you or someone else? I thought it's me. Yeah. But that's his assessment of me. But that's not my assessment of me. And ultimately, I need to believe in how I see myself. So gatekeepers are there. It could be in the form of line manager. It could be in the form of policy, practices, 
that actually limit our budget. Sometimes those policies are, are come up with unintended outcomes. They're not intended to, you know, block certain groups, but it happens. Mm. Yeah, so to answer that question, yes, there are gatekeepers. Now, the second question about what are we going to do to reform the Constitution of Promotion Panel, I'll say, quite frankly, is beyond our level, but we can contribute to it. And what I mean by that is having departments or office within institutions that actually pay attention to institutional equity. For example, my office, uh, we look at promotion practices, we sit with the vice chancellor and say, let's look at the data. What does the data tell us? Uh, so last year we had, let's, you know, for example, 60 people promoted. Can we, you know, deep dive and look at the characteristics of the people that are promoted, male, female, you know, uh, ethnic, you know, classification. That then paints a picture that stares them in the face to say, can you not tell me why we've only got two or three or nobody from a certain group? So it is from that point of understanding the data, we can then start to have conversation and then kind of challenge what next? What do we do as a result of that? I, I think someone like me being tasked with the responsibility of ensuring that my university is equitable and creates that inclusive environment. Uh, it's a big job, but I know that there are people who are allies in the university executive board that I can work with to achieve that. But it starts with recognizing what data we have, how do we look at it quite frankly, and start to work with that. So yes, it is having those conversations, also looking at the data and then the change might be slow, but it would happen. Want to add anything or we just go straight to the um, um okay. I mean just a little thing I wanted to add is that I think we should be able to have very tough conversations. So the gatekeepers knocking on the doors to talk to people. There is something I, I observe I was in a training session. Again, we are allowed to speak freely, and they were showing us data of recruitment. So, hypothet not hypothetical, but the data was that if you have uh, 20 applicants that apply for a university role, out of the 20, um, 15 of them will be from Bain, whilst the remaining five are uh, other people or the majority. But by the time the application process finishes, the appointment of the faculty member, mm -hmm. if they appoint 10, only two of them will be from the bin, and uh, the eight appointed are from the people who initially had only say um, five of the applicants or 20 of the applicants. Um, I guess that's a question that we have to ponder about. But the question is why is it so? Could it be the issue of the gatekeepers, or are we going to knock on those doors and all that? Um, any question here? Yes. So just picking up on the point about the because I think collectively we have to engage. So you talk about fixing applicants being I like your phrase, majority, not minority. <laughs> well the point is this we have quite a number of senior academics in this room. How many of the senior academics engage in the recruitment process? I do. Maybe one, two. Do we all, the research professors, grateful for you guys, do you engage in the recruitment process or is it just about the research? It has to be a collective endeavor. Now I was thinking to myself when your VC was talking and he said you have 4% paying staff. My previous institution in my department, we had 20%. It didn't happen in one day. It happened over a period of six, seven years, but we got there. And we actually, the school, my faculty had the largest pain percentage in the university. Can I ask where that is? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's the School of Leadership Management and Markets here at the Monfrey University. Okay. I'm no longer there. 
But that's that's the reality. We worked at it and we got there. But it came about as a result of the senior academics, well, the leadership engaging and actively encouraging colleagues to be part of the recruitment process. Jimmy, you're right. If you're on the panel, the, the orientation changes. And that was one thing I discovered. When I sit on the panel, the way conversations go changes. I'm able to influence and we we also need to do that. As, as a lecturer, you're asked to come and sit on a panel to recruit a, a lecturer and myself. Like we don't have time. Engage. We all have to engage to get to where we want to get. Yeah, thank you. Uh, one more question. This lady is yes. raising her hand up for a long time. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think it's really going to that point the, the idea of contract sponsorship in career, in a sense, because I think, again, just looking back into my experience when I joined as a lecturer. I definitely had a sponsorship. I didn't know it was a sponsorship, but now reflecting back, I understand it was a sponsorship. They put me in the right place. They asked me to volunteer to do this, do that, and so on and so forth. Until I became senior lecturer, but after that, it's kind of like disappeared in a sense. And now I'm trying to find my own sponsors. <laughs> so I'm just wonder what are your kind of like thoughts and perspective when it comes to career sponsorship? And, and by the way, Joe, I really like the point of kind of like you were sitting in your place. But then you are kind of like spreading, so it's almost like a new dimension of uh, disability internationalization and so on and so forth. Thank you. Thank you for that question. I, I think one of the biggest things you can do for yourself uh, in Accelerating your career is finding a sponsor. I will say that because it's worked for me. Uh, I recommend you read this book called uh, Forget Mentors, Find a Spell. Yeah, but also there's a second one, Playing Big. Um, I can't remember the name of the author. It's called Playing Big and it's written for women. Um, sorry, there's a third one. Um, driven by intentionality or something like that. But I can I can I can give you the, the full detail. I'll, I'll check. I have it in my audible. The reason I say that is because sponsorship uh, it's not something that just lands on, on your on your lap. You've got to be intentional about it. Find the right person, and the relationship's got to work. Um, they must be interested or invested in you, and also you you know doing the same. So how do you find that spaces like this one? Connecting to a community could be related to your area of expertise, maybe your discipline, uh, but also sometimes um, your institution it doesn't have to be someone within your department. I am like a magnet when I see the right person. I don't even know. I would be make sure that I befriend them. I do everything. Please take me. To. Even up till now, I have women that I just gravitate to and I tell them what I want from them and I'll make sure I get it. I'll be sleeping, dreaming about I don't give up until they tell me go with. So find that person, chase them, follow up, know what you want, and go after it because this is your career after all. Uh, again, remember we said we're going to talk after at the end of the session, so I have to share more about that. It is so key to moving forward, especially as a woman. So just to be point, so one in response to you, the points you raised earlier. Sometimes there are institutional policies that prevent people from being on panels. So, for example, I've been, I, I'm on every single panel, recruitment panel for my department because of my role yeah, as a yeah. So, some institutions have rules. The panel was made up, was made up of HOD, this, 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 this. If you don't have those roles, you can't be on the panel. So, sometimes people are willing. But because they don't have those leadership roles, they can't be on the panel. Yeah. So it all depends on institutional policy. But but I, I agree with your point. I'm just trying to say some institutions have policies that prevent people from participating. But going back to your point about sponsorship, uh, sponsorship I think Howard's um, earlier comment, comment came, comes to mind because 
um, you have to, it's not just about going to find sponsors. What do you offer to the sponsors? Yeah. The sponsors are busy. You are busy as well. So if you're going to a sponsor, this is what you're offering. Yeah. And if there's a match, then the sponsor would, uh, would replace you. Yes, just just to add to that, because that reminds me of the previous panel, right? So essentially the sponsor, you're asking the sponsor to spend his or her capital on you. So, you know, uh, the issue of bankability and everything uh, springs to mind again. So, you know, it's a scarce resource that they also have to use efficiently. Mm -hmm. And so it's going, it has to be a win-win um, transaction. Um, our time is up, right? Yes. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, what is the passing session? I was really looking forward to that. I think our um, speakers and our moderators were wonderful in um, giving us very insightful points. Thank you so much to our speakers. Thank you to our moderator. Yeah, I'll probably just like to, to, to make a point. So, right about sponsorship, mentorship, ETC. And this, this point is quite important. I think we need to recognize that people can also see through you. Okay? So you need to have a good motive. And you need to have a good heart if you need a sponsor. I can guarantee you people can see through you. If you want a sponsor and you just bash it, hey, be my sponsor. It's not going to work. All right? I, I met several wonderful people through doing SBA work or even my, my research or teaching that people have been personally to me willing and genuinely wanting to help me just because they, I just do it. I don't do it because I'm expecting something back. Okay? So I think that motive is very important. Be willing to serve. Be willing to be a steward. And you realize that when people notice that about you, oh my God, you will be overwhelmed with the type of help and support you get from people. So don't let us be opportunistic about this um, sponsorship thing. You don't just buy into people as, as they've said. Sponsors are very busy people. So why should I, I mean, got tons of emails to reply. Why should I reply you? Of course, you need to be able to approach them, but be patient as well. Don't come barging into people's spaces and expecting that they're just gonna sponsor you like that. It doesn't work that way. Have a good heart first. Okay, and work hard, and I'm sure you'll be fine. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, fantastic. Our next session, sent by um, testing, testing, and come forward. We will have a special recruiter talk for about 10 minutes or so uh, from Julia, and Julia will give us uh, videos from getting, uh, okay, yeah. getting by Sanderson, and Julia will give us some, some inspirational talk about. Our perspective. We've talked about promotion. So, what is, what then do do recruiters also expect? You know, and, and it's really lovely to have Julia here to discuss it. Over to you. Thank you. Yeah. Which man? Our session is yes, very short and sweet. Yeah. Um, when I heard about Julia, I said, "Googling was it?" <laughs> You are Robert, the actress. <laughs> <laughs> so I was saying that that's a celebrity, but nonetheless. Oh, sure, I can do the accent yeah. there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, over to you now. Tell us about, um, I, and again, the way I want to start is, I want us to bring the good news <laughs> to, the, to the amazing team. And why is that? Because there's still that gap that 52% uh, of HEIs are still waiting to recruit the right people to the right places. Mm. While at the same time, about 63% of people are still looking for the right jobs. So there's that mismatch. So can you tell us, just give hope to every one of us. Oh, ooh, lovely. So tempting to sing. Trust me, you do not want me to do that. Okay, there is really good news. There, this is a candidate's market. There is, if you look at the data, it looks like there are more people than roles, but that's not the reality. The reality is that institutions are really struggling to find the right people in for these roles. And also what is, what we're certainly finding and what we certainly hear is that there is a genuine commitment to diversity. However, there's a big but to this. 
they come to us as headhunters to say, Julia, deliver me a brilliant selection of diverse candidates, please. Mostly academics, but some very senior professional services roles as well. And my challenge back to them is where's the pipeline? What are you doing as an institution to support and encourage people to go on to do their PhDs in the first place, but then to choose academia as their home and as their career? Because the education practice at Gaten B. Sanderson exists to change the face of leadership in higher education. It is not representative of society and it does need to change. That's a big, bold statement. Some people like it, some people don't like it. But the fact is, it's we need more visible representation in leadership roles to give students, to give early career academics, to give you know graduate students hope and aspiration so that you can see yourselves in these roles. But also you need diversity of thinking in those top roles. So people come to me and they say, OK, Julia, you know, we need a vice chancellor, a deputy vice chancellor, a PVC, a dean, a head of school, you name it. We really need diversity on this list. OK, that's fine. Tell me who's going to be on your panel. Who can I speak to? Who's going to be selecting these individuals? And it's that level of challenge that we have a responsibility to give back to the institution to make sure that there is very good representation at that table on making that decision. It is about oh, I can't see the gentleman anymore. It is about making sure that the, that the dynamic in the room is there. And through that challenge, what we're finding is there there is more real diversity that's coming into that room to help challenge the thinking, the job description and the selection process. But all of that being said, there are fantastic opportunities out there for people and there's a genuine desire. But as everyone said today, it's not going to be handed to you. You need to make it easy for someone to see that you're in that role. When you're looking at the job description and I'm speaking to the women, especially sitting here, you do not need to have 100% of the experience that they're looking for. You just don't need to do it because I promise you there are going to be people out there chancing. But what you do need is to have 100% commitment that you can absolutely do this role. You've got the skills, you've got the experience, you can grow into it, you've got the vision. And not only that, you are so committed to the institution and the people and the communities that you're serving that you are the best person to do this role. And then you have to make it easy for them because you have to draft a narrative that's going to tell them that in the beginning. Because if they're working with individuals like me, if they're working with companies like mine, like with Gate and B, we're going to be the filter. We're going to be the first filter, right? I can tell within 60 seconds who really wants this job. It's not who necessarily might be right for it, but it's who wants it. And if you see who wants it, you're going to give that time. You're going to give that extra time, that extra attention, and you're going to go that extra mile to Google, to pick up the phone, to talk to someone, to find out more about them, to really understand why. What's the driver? What's the motivation? So write a compelling story. You know, when you think about promotion panels, it's the same with when you're applying for a role. A supporting statement is a compelling story about why you want this and what you're going to do for that institution and how that institution is going to be better by having you there. And as I was telling some colleagues sitting around at lunch, this is not a time to be shy. This is a time to own your narrative, to own your experience. You're not being boastful. You're not bragging. You're being honest about what you've done. And you're being honest about what your trajectory is and where you're going to do. So if there's ever going to be a time when you're going to need to be maybe a little bit uncomfortable and talk about yourself and be your own champion, that's the time. And if there is a headhunter involved, if there is a someone like me or my brilliant team who work with me involved, use us. Pick up the phone. We really, really want to hear from you. And can I give you one more piece of advice? If someone reaches out to you, you get an email and they reach out to you and they want to talk to you about a job. Talk to them because they have found you. They want to know about you. They genuinely do. It's not any sort of time waste. The only people that people in roles like mine is because they love people and they love what you're trying to do. So use us. We are hired by institutions, but we serve you. We serve the candidate community and never, ever forget that. You're never going to waste anyone's time. 
um, because we really will fail our institutions if we can't inspire and engage this community to take a chance because we need you and higher education needs you. And I'm so sorry, I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> I'm really passionate about this. I mean, I, I really am. And I've, I've not had as much fun ever at a conference as I have done today because the authenticity. And I love the fact that there is a community. And, you know, I'm sitting before you with a title of Mrs., right? If you invite me back in a decade, I would love to be able to join you with a doctor in front of my name. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll leave it to the audience now. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. And, um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Any questions? Uh, any questions? Okay. It's more of a comment than a question. Um, a lot of times you get, I mean, I get head on to reaching out to me. We have this role, we have that role, and we can do it. We recommend someone. And sometimes I don't respond at all. Other times um, I may have been answered by when the recommender me to say, can you go shoot the response And I have to confess that a few times I've actually felt like this position is two times above my level. So I've been invited to um, apply for a DPC role. And I'm like, I wish you to be a wisdom that time, you know. And, and it goes back to what you just said about you don't need to meet all of the requirements. I've looked at the requirements and all of those I'm thinking, but I meet about 60% of this. I'm not going until I, you know, give me two more years and I'll come back to you and I'll met all of that. And that's a beautiful you know, woman for you. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I just want to say thank you. Uh, it's not that I don't even preach these to others. Do <laughs> and say, make sure that you don't wait until you're 100% before you apply for something. But when something applies to you, sometimes you forget that matter. You even know it. Like, okay, why, why would you invite me to come and apply for a death device council when you know I'm not there that yet? So, I think it's just kind of caring from someone like you who you're in the field, you're you know, actually you know, talking to people. Uh, and understanding that there's something they're seen in you, there's something they have, there's a research they've done for them to actually reach out to you. So engage with them, have that yes. conversation. Uh, and even if at that time it doesn't lead anywhere, at least um, you have that conversation, giving them the opportunity to tell you more about the role, which might you know, help you make your mind or maybe uh, not to take it at all. I have even more advice, Jamie. Yeah. Ask, oh, sorry, I'm so used to my voice carrying. There we go. Very loud. Ask the headhunter who reaches out, why? Why have you contacted me? Mm -hmm. That's a really important question because first of all, you want to make sure that you're not ticking a box somewhere. That's the important thing. But also you'll hear someone, someone's external view as to why they're reaching out to you. Um, thank you for the question. I really enjoyed the talk. I've got a tension question, and, and, and I ask it because I'm slightly intrigued by the, the methodology of both recruiters. I can recall at least four different times I've been head of the business in other positions in institutions, which also me, I'm class on being targeted with hospital passes. Roles that are in organisations that are challenging their problems there and they're looking for me to come in and fix it. And there are a number of studies that, that do have shown that that's what they ask black people to do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> especially I, women. And come in and fix problems that are often, more often than not, are unfixable. They do do it. <laughs> so I was curious to, to understand that mentality and your experience, why that happens. That's a really good point because <clears throat> there have been studies, as you've seen, where particularly black women are invited in to fix something and they do fix it, but then there's nowhere to go or else they're going to be guaranteed to fail. 
and therefore it's not going to do anyone else any service or it's not going to do anyone any services. So I, I mean, genuinely hand on heart, have never been in that situation where I've had that unfixable problem. And normally if there is an unfixable problem, we suggest they find an interim solution where they have, a, you know, where there's a bank of brilliant people who go in and fix and they're not worried about their long term career. They're just known as fixers. But one of the things that I would throw back to the candidate, you know, you and that experience is to challenge that with those questions, because it's well, what's the long term? You know, what's the long term strategy? You need me to fix this. But actually, in three years time, what's this role going to look like? And am I still going to have the right skill set? And I go back to my point about it being a candidate's market to be able to push back and to say that. Um, and I think it just if I'm going to be I'm going to be completely honest. It's going to come down to the intelligence and the integrity of the search consultant that you're working with to really get under the skin of that to decide how they are going to be able to talk about that role because we've got a big duty of care and most colleagues and competitors as well have a big duty of care to candidates and it's really important that we don't derail your career by putting up a deaf position and as I always tell my new hires who come into my team, and indeed my guys who've been working with me for a long time, if you ever forget the inadvertent power that we play in someone's life, then you need to stop doing what you're doing. So I wish I could answer it more fully than that, but unfortunately it does happen. And I think it's about you as a candidate using your power to vote with your feet as to whether or not you want to go for it. To be flattered that you're being asked, but to be smart enough to say, I'm not going to touch that. Thank you very much for your presentation. And, and I'm going to be vulnerable, believe it or not, and to be open with the audience. I also have issues <laughs> and moving forward. I just don't want to say profits are in and but I would like to know what are the schemes and systems available to black females to actually shift the income property mm -hmm. to, for example, vice kind of vice chancellor vice as well as engagement. Mm -hmm. yeah. Vice chancellor. Yeah. It's interesting that you ask that because we are just in the process at the moment of creating a program that's going to look at supporting women on their leadership journey. Now, this is something I'm also interested in doing. I've spoken with Amy about this, about how we can work with the Society of Black Academics as well to look at a wider leadership program. But at the moment, Advance AG and WIN do some really interesting things. So what we're doing is looking something that's going to be additive. It's not going to be taking away. It's not going to be replicating what's already been done. But instead, it's drawing on the power of networks and the power of powerful women who are already there to come in to help support, guide, shape, and also help you think about your story, your narrative, and where are the gaps in your CV so that we can tell you where you need to get to. And then who can we pair you up with? to be able to help you do that. Um, and again, when I come back in 10 years time with a doctor in front of my name, that's the bit that I want it to be on. It is the power of that network because I think it is so important and it's so vital. I have a question. Okay, I think this is more focused on the idea of tick boxes. Sometimes I think when you're invited to become part of panels or things like that, I think there's a whole thing about diverse inclusion. How do you pick out with an organisation who's trying to tick, tick a box and not allow us to have our voice play? I think sometimes like, okay, they look okay, sitting amongst them, tick the box. But for me, I will say when, when I go there, I want to speak and I honestly speak from the heart and mind as well. If I'm obviously looking for these roles, what kind of advice can you give me? Thanks. That's a really good question. <clears throat> Excuse me. Look at their website. What's it look like? Is there anything about diversity? Is there are there any images, messages, language, inclusivity that you're seeing? Um, because you don't see that if the if the collateral 
that comes with the job description does not have inclusive language, if there's nothing about inclusivity, the time to challenge, the time to change, then it's kind of pointless because you're going to be a lone voice. And everyone in this room is going to know that you have been asked to sit on something, to do something, to basically be a face. What you need to be able to have is a voice. And that's really, really powerful. So do your homework, really have a look and see, does this organization align to my values? Does it, is it going to look, is there any evidence that it's going to actually appreciate what I have to say and the way I think? What about organisations that are going through that transition? Because I sit as a non-executive director for a government body. I'm the only person of colour. First time we've had women on the board and their whole thing was we were going through transition. We didn't realise our recruitment were very biased. We went through a process. We wanted people with 25 to 30 years of high level leadership experience. Inherently, we saw it discriminating women, people, of mm -hmm. colour, we didn't realise until we actually went through conscious and unconscious bias training and then we changed it, we took that off and then all of a sudden we got younger people in, people with someone of colour and then we didn't realise we we're going through this and we wanted it, but if you look on their website you'll see old white men with privileged backgrounds. But when, when I met them, I think came the board, it was very welcome to me. Um, but but I, I guess it's a case that might be um, one-off case, there might be other cases that are not like that. I mean, I think we're all going to know that there are that so many organizations are on a journey right now. So you're just going to have to go with your gut. You know, that's the thing. You're going to have to get a look and a feel, do your research. Um, there is an inherent bias in non-executive boards at the moment. It's something that I think a lot of people are aware of. No one knows how to fix it. So hopefully we'll be part of the solution. Yeah. Very much. Um, do you got our next speakers waiting online? Yes. You're doing my option for the second time, and that's not fair. Okay. okay. Uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry, the voice. <laughs> Trying to be pushed anyway, but I'm just trying to contribute something. Okay. Um, this is a big issue anyway for people trying to get jobs into the UK system. Young people keep applying and when they do the first application and they don't get uh, good feedback or possibly they're not being shortlisted, it's just a second time for it. They just get tired and give up. I want to tell you something, don't give up. Because opportunities are there for you to grab them. But what you need to do is be consistent and try to dot your eyes and cross your teeth. For example, don't apply for a role you're not qualified for. <laughs> no, hang on. Each time an interview or uh, um, an advice is being put on, the recruiter will basically tell you what they want. I'm telling you from experience. I recently joined the University of Manchester as a lecturer, and I'm just the youngest and the only black man in the department of 50 lecturers. So I'm giving um, my examples based on people coming to me to tell me, look, I've tried this option. I've tried 10 times, 20. I'm not getting it. I keep telling them, okay, I have three jobs to choose from one. Mm. It's not because I'm the best person anyway, but I try to express what I'm able to do, what I've got to the employer. So if I just have been listed, try to match up those criteria as one after the other. That gives you the point to come out for the interview. So I think this should be um, something we need to consider when applying for jobs. Thank you. Your final words? I think my, fi my final words, and I'm going to be really open and honest about this, be ambitious, <laughs> know where you want to go, don't let anything hold you back. But also you've got to have a real clarity and vision and purpose. Know where you want to go, know where the gaps are, and look at filling those gaps. And when you're applying for a role, make it so that they can't turn you down because you've answered every single question and you've been really compelling. But good luck and thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you.
to one two day after. No, no, two day after. Just one two day. Um, and again, I'll just share my personal experience. I think one of the key words that come out of the process time, it's time driven, it's process driven, as well as time. Role of the lines of failure, try to understand the role of the gatekeepers, try to understand the role of the institutions as well. And one of the things that I also keep on that point is let us be key players in all of these processes. And I'll share one personal experience. I don't know why it's important. I belong to a faculty where I'm the only. <laughs> so, uh, but of course, not quite this, but I need to share this. Having understood that as an advantage, I saw an advantage in that. I think in Kotla marketing, we had a big disadvantage. That's every four them is brilliantly disguised opportunities. So I went in, I applied, I became a member of Senate, I became a member of Council, and I became a member of Courts this year. So at the highest level of decision that came to the university, I'm there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Julia. Thank you, Justine. Well, don't go yet, because the, the next speakers are actually waiting. They've been waiting for a while, so we need to say sorry to them. Uh, the next speakers are waiting. Thank you so much, Julia. That was a very insightful presentation. And I thought that was quite useful if we heard from the likes of Chidi, uh, Chadin, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Jimmy about uh, promotion. We also needed to hear from the recruiters' perspective as well. But um, the next session for me affects me. I know it probably affects you too. Why? Because we, 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 are, we are now living in a, in a society that has a lot of inflationary pressure pumping into you know, our pockets, right? The cost of living has increased. You know, um, we probably haven't seen that sort of increase matching with our income. So it's, it's really good to have a session talking about becoming an entrepreneurial academic. Uh, and like, like I said before, this topic actually came up from our last context when Kenneth was talking about the fact that academics shouldn't be broke, okay? <laughs> academics should actually have money, right? I mean, if you spend time writing papers, going for five rounds of review, getting your paper published in a four-star journal or, I mean, whatever star, and you, you still don't have enough money in your pocket, of what use is it, you know? <laughs> No, seriously. Uh, and actually, I was speaking to another senior colleague of mine last week who was supposed to come for this conference, but he couldn't make it. And he was saying that, I think, you know, another thing that has struck me as a professor lately is that we professors actually, we carry the professorial title on our head. Like, professor, a professor. Not forgetting, or always forgetting that, uh, always forgetting that our kids are not necessarily going to be professors. What we leave back for our children is money and property and you know yep. value stocks in the in, in, in the stock market, right? So we need to realize that we need to live in reality as academics to understand that at the end of the day, when you go to the bank and you want to buy a property, of course the mortgage broker will ask you uh, what do you do for a living to try to pay keep it and pay or have some deposit on some sort of, some sort of sustainability. But what really matters is that they ask you another question, is how much do you have now? Drop levels in your monkey. And you don't tell them that, hey, look, I've published five, five something. You know, I have to be conscious of my pocket as well as my academic career. So I think it's a real pleasure to have today uh, Professor Rob Hanfield, who's a, I mean, I was really careful. Uh, who do we get to come and speak on this topic? It's a very critical issue. So Rob is a Bank of America University in distinguished professor uh, of supply chain management. He is actually one of the big names in supply chain, was a journal editor, journal of supply chain uh, operations management for a lot of years. And he's, he's done a lot of work in the field, very known in the US. We've also got Professor Noreen Ashen, who's a professor of entrepreneurship and innovation at Strathclyde. And then we've got Professor Kenneth Ameshi. Kenneth actually hosted NBA's first ever conference. So it's really lovely to have him again support us uh, with our work. Kenneth is currently at the European University Institute in Florence. 
it is currently there uh, for the next five years or so, while still keeping its position at the University of Edinburgh in, in, in Southern. How do you even do that? That's what it's about. It's about the length of care. So over to you guys online. Uh, oh, sorry, and our moderator, our wonderful moderator we have for last day, who is actually joining from Lagos, uh, Nigeria. For last day, is a senior lecturer in law at the University of Liverpool. For last day, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much and well, um, hello to everyone. I thought Ade was not going to introduce me, so I was already looking for how I was going to attack him. Um, can I just confirm you can hear me okay? Yeah. Is that fine? Fantastic. So I'm really honoured to be moderating this session. Um, I just want to introduce the speakers first uh, before we hit the ground running. So we have uh, Professor Rob Hanfield, who I believe will join us soon, uh, but he doesn't seem to be here with us at the moment. Um, we have Professor Naurin Alshed. I hope I've not murdered your name. Did I say that correctly? Yep, yeah, fantastic. Um, who's a professor at the University of Dundee and also Professor Kenneth Ameshi. Um, so I think I'll just hit the ground running um, and start off with the first question to kind of put us into uh, or put us in the theme of the discussion. Um, and I'll, maybe I'll start with Naurin. Um, what would you describe an entrepreneurial academic as, or who, what, 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 what encapsulates such a person? Thank you. Um, thank you for having me here, firstly. Um, and I've just moved from Dundee to Strathclyde last month, so I'm at University of Strathclyde, not Dundee, um, just in case anybody looks for an email address. Um, so for me, it's a lot of different things, but I think one of my, my friends and colleagues who wrote a paper in 2018 um, encapsulated an entrepreneurial academic very well in her study. Um, and, and what her and her team said was academics who engage in less formal collaborative knowledge transfer activities. Um, and they engage in um, these informal knowledge transfer activities to help them with their research, their teaching, their impact. And I think that touches upon and encapsulates what this morning's discussion and speakers were saying um, regarding impact and building those relationships and um, to ensure they have impact in the work that we do as academics. So I think it's really important that we have a, a clear um, understanding of an entrepreneurial academic. So it's a little bit of everything in terms of collaborating but it's much more less formal collaborations. It's that knowledge exchange activity that you do with your fellow academics, um, with commercial partners, with government, um, with SMEs industry. So I think that for me is really being an entrepreneurial academic. Fantastic. And Kenneth, any thoughts? Um. I think uh, that's a very good uh, articulation of it, uh, but I think beyond what we do with our academic um, competence or our research, you may also find an academic entrepreneur who does other things beyond being in the classroom or doing research. There are many academics that have invested significantly uh, in stock exchange or in property and other things, and those things that they can do in, in, in addition to the academic work. And um, sometimes I tell, uh, I make a joke that I, I appear to be retired already, because I mean, as an academic, you have time and you can also plan things. Uh, you can write when others are sleeping and walk and <laughs> doing other things. So that flexibility in itself can help us do other things in relation, in addition to our academic job. I think the point I want to make uh, in relation to what uh, Noreen said is to make that distinction between using what we produce as academics as, as, uh, as uh, a component of that entrepreneurial process and also using something outside what we do, uh, something we have passion for, competence for, and, and to make money or contribute to society. That's an interesting take. I think for me, um, and I just want to put this caveat out there. So I'm Nigerian and we are, so I can speak for myself, we're the most direct people. Um, so for me, an entrepreneurial academic is someone who can use their profile or their academic profile to translate that into money. 
Now that finance or that money, and this is just my perspective. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I don't think I there's a lot of Nigerians here. <laughs> oh yes, I mean, I, I'm I'm right at home. We're 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 very um direct and straight to the point. You know, sometimes it it, it sometimes is interpreted as offensive, but it's not our intention. We're just very direct. So for me, an entrepreneur academic is someone who can use their academic profile to their benefit in terms of it translating to money. And I think one of the things is being able to look at yourself separate from an academic, being in the classroom, doing teaching and research and thinking about the skill set that you have and how you can use that to generate funds for yourself. Um, it might be either generating personal funds for yourself, so it might be consulting um, and I'll, I'll go into some of those questions afterwards. It might even be you making sure that you're adding more value to increase your salary at your current institution. So I think it's also about mindset, about thinking about maybe going outside the scope of thinking what an entrepreneur or academic is. Um, and I think that brings me quite nicely to the second question in terms of well, what is the purpose of academic entrepreneurship? Um, and I think in terms of you, um, the two, two speakers answering this question, if you can share some of your background, I think that that would be quite helpful. So I think now, Rin, you've done quite a lot of work with women entrepreneurship. And I think, Kenneth, you're um, quite into consultancy. So I think if you could share your experiences and that would really help us uh, drive the conversation. So now, Rin, would you like to go first? Oh, you're, you want me to go first? OK, so I think I'm um, just touching upon your last point. So I think being an entrepreneur um, scholar and its semantics. So an entrepreneurial academic is one that, you know, uh, the one that builds these formal knowledge exchange um, for teaching, research, impact, funding, etc. The entrepreneur academic is one who you've just described. So there's slight variances, but I think they go hand in hand um, because you need what you, you spot on when you said you need to have an entrepreneurial mindset. Um, so I think, um, I think, I came into academia later in life, so I spent eight or nine years working in um, government and banking in London um, and then decided I was bored earning so much money that I had to come back to Scotland and Glasgow and, and live in peanuts and do a PhD. Um, I was bored basically in my jobs um, and you were kind of in a box, you couldn't do this, this and that. Um, so I came back home to do a PhD, so I had eight years of experience behind me working as a senior civil servant and then a senior economist in banking. So I had huge amounts of knowledge and um, experience that I brought in with me to do a PhD. Um, and I think that really stood me in good stead and I have capitalised on that. So a lot of my work is around economic and enterprise policy um, and I look at um, inclusive entrepreneurship. So I kept my um, collaborations with industry and uh, government especially. Um, so I've always tapped into government um, to help me with my research or um, to open doors for me. So I think that's been a huge um, entrepreneurial mindset for me in terms of having different experiences from my knowledge, experience and background to bring into the academia world. Um, so I think that helps. Um, and. I've never been a traditional researcher um, in terms of, you know, um, obviously we have to, uh, it's been talked about a lot, you know, I've heard REF mentioned quite a lot today. Universities are REF driven, we know this. Um, academics are REF driven, but actually there's more to academia than REF. Um, yes, we have to tick box those KPIs, we need outputs, we now need impact, we need to um, focus on PhD supervision, you know, there's so many tick boxes. So as an academic, how do we manage this? We have to be entrepreneurs or have an entrepreneurial mindset to manage this because what we're doing is dealing with 10 different jobs in one job description. Um, so I think um, reaching out to others um, to help and support and build that entrepreneurial mindset to become an entrepreneurial academic is definitely worthwhile doing both for your own research and teaching, to meet the KPIs, to become more holistic as an academic, um, but also to keep those networks and doors open because I think someone mentioned that, you know, um, we can't do research on our own. We can't do impact on our own. So being entrepreneurs, 
entrepreneurial as an academic, I don't think you have a, a say. I think it's it's a must. It's it's become fundamental to our jobs. Fantastic. Thank you. Kenneth, do you want to jump in in that? OK, I think that in the, I, I seem to have a similar career background uh, with Noreen. I started off as a management consultant uh, in Nigeria. Um, and one thing I found in consulting is that um, although it's intellectually stimulating, but you do it because of the money. So, uh, and that tends to take away that intellectual freedom. So when I was in consulting, there were some um, studies I, I was interested in, but I couldn't do them because uh, at that point in time, my employer couldn't see the reason for doing them. And secondly, um, they didn't make money. They were just kind of speculative. So I thought I couldn't do that for long. So I skipped into the academia. Okay, but when I came into the academia, I also recognized my first degree, by the way, is philosophy. And I came into management uh, scholarship and I noticed that management scholarship was damn philosophical, right? You know, to the point that it didn't make sense. Then I thought to myself, why bother if I wanted to do philosophy? I would rather go to philosophy department, right? And then my academic background, uh, sorry, my um, professional or consulting background kicked in and I was more interested in terms of how to solve problems and solve problems that companies will pay for or governments or whoever will be interested in. So what I've done in that sense is, for me, the purpose, going back to your question, for being an academic entrepreneur, is that it is a way I've used to find meaning in my own work. Um, so as opposed to doing something that is very um, ivory tower oriented, uh, and also something that is very mundane in terms of everyday consulting, a combination of both um, helps me a lot because I choose when I want to do the consulting and also choose when I want to philosophize. So that for me is a good space to be in. So I'm not pressured by the demands of consultants making money uh, and pursuing research projects that are linked to profit only. And, and at the same time, I'm not drawn into this excessive uh, philosophizing that goes into ma management scholarship in particular of recent. So it, it, it's, it's a balancing act for me and uh, that's why I enjoy it. Thank you very much for that. I think that's that's really insightful. Um, so what I'm deducing um, from, from the two of you is, I mean, you're, you're obviously at the peak of your careers. You've been able to achieve quite a great deal. And I'm quite interested in how you've been able to make that pivot from industry to academia, but still balance the two. Um, I think quite a few people in the audience might be quite interested in terms of how you've been able to keep um, those two priorities aligned and how that's impacted. So perhaps if we start with Kenneth first and then we'll move to Nowrin. Um, I think the transition in, in, in itself for me was natural because I, I came from consulting and I had the confidence because sometimes also if you are very much in that, into the academia, you tend to be shy or less confident because you think the managers or those in practice understand it more than you do. So, and I see that also when I interact with some of my colleagues who went straight from first degree, master's, PhD, and they're teaching, they're usually scared about the scale of uh, practitioners and they tend to stay away from them and con concentrate on what they do very well. So sometimes when you see academics who are pumping out papers and papers and papers, you may want to also understand their, their fears because their fears can help you appreciate what they are publishing a lot. And it's a way to compensate because you publish, you get good jobs, you get um, increase in salaries. Uh, but you can also say, well, I don't want to publish that lot, but I can publish enough to uh, keep my employer happy. And then I make money, I compensate. So I can stay on a salary and make more money than somebody who has published a lot and moved on. And is also making good money to uh, what the university is paying. So in terms of the transitioning, um, I think I would say it, it's, it's a much, in my own case, it was natural that I progress into it. But for somebody who is coming into it, one way is to look 
towards maybe academics who have done it and see if you can partner with them, learn from them. Um, the other point might also be to find a way to make friends in quotes or even um, mentors from industry so that way they can bring, in, bring you in occasionally and socialize into it. Once you've done it once, twice, you start to build that confidence that you can do this and the managers are not scary and sometimes also they have their own issues and as an academic they are looking towards you also for solution. So once you begin to have do that confidence, it helps a lot in the transition. I think the key point for me here will be to identify a mentor earlier on. Um, and then the other thing is that you need to be truly interested in it. Because one thing is to say, I want to do it, but you are not. In, if you are a pure academic and you enjoy theorizing, that's not a problem. You enjoy it, do it. But if there is that part of you that is interested in practice, then you need to find a way to nurture it either by speaking to senior colleagues in, in the academia or uh, finding mentors in industry. Thank you, and Naren, any thoughts? Yeah, I, I completely agree with Kenneth. I have met so many academics who are scared um, and they just won't get in touch with policymakers, government, industry, um, and because of my experience and my roles with REF um, as a, a, an impact panel member, I've been able to really push colleagues um, and open doors and say, OK, here's policymakers, write to them. Because everybody wants free research, everybody wants um, free consultancy. And I know there's a big, um, you know, Kenneth mentioned it, and I think um, it was mentioned before as well, about consultancy, topping up your salary. A lot of universities frown upon that. So you'll know that within your own universities, you can't do consultancy work unless the university can take. I know one university in Scotland who takes 80 percent of the consultancy fee. So if you're bringing in 100 pound, the university takes 80 pound and you get 20 pound, but you still need to pay tax on that 20 pound by yourself through self-employment. So, you know, it's not worth doing. Um, but if you you know want papers from it, you want to make impact, you want to make a difference, then you're pushed to do it, then you have to take up the consultancy work, but it's very hard to do consultancy work to top up your money. And I think a lot of academics shy away from that and they think, well, I'm doing all the work and the university's taking a huge chunk, um, <laughs> which I, I completely disagree with. Um, yeah. But, you know, I've always been a bit scared not to do the uni says in case they fire me. Um, but um, it is hard and, and there's ways around that which I obviously don't want to go into because we're being recorded. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Kenneth's laughing because he knows. Um, <laughs> but as you learn and start talking to and I think it's very important if you want to be an entrepreneurial academic that you get yourself out there, you get your work known and it's not about sending papers or outputs or your publications to industry or policymakers or third sector organisations, they don't care. They won't understand it. They don't care for the theory. What they want is what's the gap in the sector and how can you help? A paragraph, layman's terms. And you, you know what? Without a doubt, you will get them getting back to you. I have never been turned down um, from anybody. And I'm not saying this. I think there's a bit of luck in there and I always sign off my email to buy a free, to, I always offer a coffee and cake at the end of it, so that helps. But I've never been turned down from government, and I've worked with Japanese government, the Brazilian government, and UK government. So it's not, you know, it's not just one group I've worked with. I work with lots of industry, um, uh, and if you email them and say, I have an interesting topic that I've just researched, here's the gap in the sector or the policy, and this is how I can inform and influence, and here's a solution. Would you like to work with me? Um, and they've always said, yes, how can we help? Because they get free work from you and they might give you something nice at the end, you know, that you don't need to declare. Um, but again, you know, that's nice because that builds up and opens doors. So it is all about, you know, getting your work out there um, strategically. And I think I've been lucky since I came from industry um, uh, to do my PhD. Um, I've had um, brilliant mentors and I know um, the lady this morning talked about her own mentors um, in one of the, se the impact sessions. Um, I've had, and funnily enough, I've had three male, I don't want to say older, but they were older professors um, who have been my mentors. I've never had a woman say to me, 
do you, do you need support? How can I help you? Which I have found hugely, you, you know, I, I don't know how to explain how I felt about that in academia. Um, not one woman, whether they've been of women of colour or women of same race, religion, has said, let's sit down, let's strategize your career. Um, I've had three fantastic, um, you know, everybody bashes the white males, but um, you know what, hats off to them because they're the only ones that have supported me. And I think in academia, you take the support where you can, you take the help where you can, regardless of race, regardless of religion, but it is a tough gig for people who are brown or black or Muslim or women. So there is, you know, we are disadvantaged, but I do think we can help in terms of opening our own doors, getting out there, um, being entrepreneurial, chapping on doors and not being scared about it. Um, I know that sounds very fluffy, but that's the only thing I can say that I actually did was chap on doors um, and people open them. I've never had a door closed on me. So I don't know what Kenneth's or Robert's experiences are with that. Yeah, yeah. But before maybe uh, Robert comes in, uh, Rob, welcome by the way. Uh, I, I think the point you made about money is very important. So at the University of Edinburgh, where I'm currently on leave of absence, it's a different game. So they don't take 80%. So if you work with the business school, maybe that will happen. But Edinburgh has what they call Edinburgh Innovation, which is more like the consultancy arm of the university. And when I was there, I tended to channel my projects through Edinburgh Innovation because they take only 10%, right? So the rest is between you. So they give the business school 10%, and then the rest is between you and the tax man. So it's up to you what you do with that. <laughs> You know, so uh, sometimes they give you the option you can save the money and use it for research because I was doing a lot of that. So I was not going for your typical research grant, but I get money to consulting or whatever, and then I bring it into this university and use it for for research. Mm -hmm. But I think the other point I want to make quickly is the also the idea that we can also do other things beyond using our academic work. So mm -hmm. there are a lot of academics. Can, I mean, they have uh, properties they have invested in. Some can also work with their uh, partners or wives and create family businesses. That that way you carry, you know, your family along as you do your academic work. And that in itself can also provide new opportunities because when you do that, you also gain experience you can bring back into the classroom. And going back again to the point about universities, uh, I think the earlier conversation was about recruitment or promotion. If you are changing jobs, it's also good to ask as part of your negotiation, would you allow me to do consulting? How much will you take from it? Right? So you have all this because you are going to a university that should be your total package. When I was moving from Edinburgh or coming on leave of absence to the European University Institute, I had to have that conversation. And uh, we find an amicable way of accommodating that interest. So I think it's also something important to mention so that when you are negotiating, don't just set it aside or see it as something you will stumble on, but you can also create it and shape it as you are coming to the, the university. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So just a very quick welcome to Professor Hanfield. Thank you for joining us uh, today. Um, I will come to you with one of my questions, but I just wanted to piggy bank on, on and unpack quite a lot of um, of what has been said. I've made a couple of notes, so I'll try and pick them uh, one by one. Um, I think, uh, Naren, you mentioned about getting your work known and it, it brings me to a question I asked this morning in an earlier panel, um, which I, I hope I didn't shake too many tables. Um, one of the challenges that I find um, as a, a BAME academic is that when you send work out, when you send work out for review, you some of the comments that you sometimes get um, are not really comments that one can even repeat, but I'll put that to one side. I think that the main question I want to ask is for colleagues who are interested in academic entrepreneurship, in order for them to climb up the ladder, do they need to engage in more collaboration with non BAME colleagues in order to get their work known? Because the challenge that I found, although I'm coming from a, a law perspective, the challenge I found is that Let's say banking, for example, it's a very big area. It's very saturated with non bank colleagues. However, when it comes to banking in Africa, banking in Nigeria, and I say this with a lot of humility, I would be one of the first people that you might 
look up because I've written quite a lot in that. However, I've had to do a lot of legwork in order to get my name known. I've had to engage in collaborations in order to get my work out there. So my question is, for this particular, in terms of this particular um, theme and, and question that we're looking at, do BAME colleagues need to collaborate with non-BAME colleagues in order to create their profile or improve their profile for them to stand a chance of climbing up the ladder? And I'd really like to hear um, everyone's views on this. So I don't know who would like to start first. I see Narin shaking your head. I hope I've not broken too many tables. No, uh, no, um, of course not. I don't think so. Um, uh, going back to an earlier point that was discussed, I think it was uh, Julia um, at the careers, or is it Julia? Sorry, I've forgotten. Was it, I, I just remember, is it Julia Roberts or Julia Roberts who was saying about, um, you know, being on panels? I, I'm in a lot of um, four-star journal review boards. Um, everything's anonymised. So we don't know. OK, it might give us an indication if the context is Nigeria or Pakistan. So you kind of know who one author is of that descent because they have an interest in the country or of that cultural background. And um, I've been on a lot of panels for shortlisting principals, vice principals, deans, professors, all the way you know, from early career researchers. And I have never personally and I, and, I, and, I, and I can speak for a lot of colleagues that I work with um, it's the quality of work um, it is not who's you've collaborated okay you've got some high hygienes you've got those who write seminal pieces of work um, and you know they, not, they don't always get published either um, but I think we have to think about the quality of work and in journal publications, for example, there's theoretical contributions. So is the theory strong? If it's impact case studies, is there evidence of impact? What types of impact? So I think we need to take a step back and say, OK, I understand there's huge evidence to say that uh, people of colour, women of colour are behind in academia in terms of salary and promotions. But we also need to think about why and it's not always colour it might be they're not given the chance to collaborate they're not given the chance to do quality work they're not given the time to make quality um to undertake quality research um so i don't think it just lies with um collaborating with different types of people to publish a paper i think the first thing that we need to look at is the quality of work um and i think it's unfair um you know i could say that oh well i've been published and some great four star journals. Is it because I'm brown? They saw a brown name and said, oh, we need a brown person in, in the journal today. So <laughs> let, let, let's bung Noreen through. So you can take that in two ways. Does that make sense? So I think, and I'd like to think that all the work I've done over the years has got nothing to do with being a token brown Muslim woman on the panel or on a paper. It's because of my expertise and my knowledge and the quality of my work, but that might be very naive of me. So I'm going to hand it over and shut up now in case, you know, I know I'm being a little naive on that. I've had a very good academic career um, and I know there's there's some of its luck. Um, <coughs> but I'm going to stop there and pass it to Rob and, and Kenneth. Thank you. So if we start with Kenneth first and then um, okay. I'm going to go to Rob, a question with Rob. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a very good question, right? I would say there are four things uh, I, I will put into that. One, if you're talking about the quality of work, I would say quality of work is key, but it also depends on the outlet. If you have your papers in org science or strategic management journal or administrative science quarterly, the managers will not read them. So forget it, okay? Uh, sorry, there is noise in the background. I don't know. Uh, OK, fine. The managers will not find you there. OK, but get your papers into have a business review. Although on our side, we think it's a three star or whatever star it is. It has that. But if you're looking for work, if you want consultancy, that's what managers read. I think the point I'm trying to make there is publish or try to summarize things or get into where these managers are. So irrespective of your color, they see your work, they reach out to you. The second thing is, if you have a chance to name your chair, please make sure that it is industry friendly. Mm. 
that chair, name of your chair. So I give you an instance. When I was at Edinburgh, I'm still there anyway. So my chair was business and sustainable development. OK, and it attracted certain people to me. But when I moved to the European University Institute, I changed my chair to sustainable finance and governance. And it opened doors. It created another community of practice for me. So if you have a chance to choose your name, don't just choose a title that looks like an another academic paper. Nobody will understand what you're talking about. Pick a chair that resonates. Then the other thing is the platform. If you are Harvard, you get the sort of people that want to bring you out from time to time. Sorry, there is no, just a minute. There's an ambulance that's going by. Okay, good. So if you're at Harvard, you get the kind of people that you meet either through executive education or other means, or even people go on their websites. If you're London Business School, you attract different people. I think the point I'm trying to make here is that the reputation of your organization matters. Organizations or managers deliberately choose certain consultancy firms, the big four, just for brand identification. Right. So if you are in an obscure university, you need to be extremely good for them to find you. So it must be out of necessity that they'll come to you. Otherwise, they are not just coming for you alone as an academic, they are also interested in that brand association with your university. So if you are at the London School of Economics, if you are at Oxford, if you are Cambridge, the people you attract will be different if we are somewhere else. I mean, I let's be frank about it. Right. And then, um, Adeye, uh, Adeye Mo, uh, or Falasha, sorry. The, Falasha. Okay, the, the other thing he talked about is your audience. You know, he said when it comes to Nigeria, Africa, um, you also need to be aware of competition. And I, I won't pretend about this. I won't drag with a white man or a white woman in an area that they, they know very well or they are equally competent. Because when push comes to show, it's, it's a game of um, familiarity. The people who choose right. people they are familiar with or they have something in common with, and that's the natural thing. So what I've done is to create my own blue ocean strategy and leave their saturated area. So when it comes to sustainable finance in the global south, I think you will find me somewhere, but I'm not competing with them in terms of sustainable finance in the global north. So find your audience, find your audience, find your niche and go into it. I think that's, I, I can stop there. Fantastic, thanks. So it's about identifying your niche and making it your own, essentially, is what yes. I've got from the two of you. Fantastic. Yes, I've got competition, uh, if you can. <laughs> <laughs> if you can, yes. I think so we'll go over to Rob now. Um, thank you so much again for joining us. So we've been talking about uh, the purpose of academic entrepreneurship. And I think it'd be quite interesting if you can just share a bit of your background, particularly I'm personally interested in this Bank of America professorship. If you can just tell us what is that? What does that mean? So if you can share that with us. It, yeah, sure. So uh, I'm a professor of supply chain management. I've been at North Carolina State now for 23 years. Um, my my uh, professorship is a, uh, it's a, a named chair. So it basically just means that uh, many years ago, Bank of America created uh, an endowment um, to uh, have a named professor, and I happen to be that individual. So um, that title will pass on to somebody else after afterwards. Um, I've, I've really been listening to um, uh, Norrin's and Kenneth's uh, discussions. It's, it's really interesting for me to hear uh, different perspectives, and I, I agree wholeheartedly you know that that I think to be an entrepreneur, an academic entrepreneur, you really have to almost be thinking about your brand, and and how do you promote your brand? And uh, again, I'm a business professor, so I think in in these terms. Um, and and the way the way I got involved is one of the biggest ways you can get involved is to volunteer uh, for different types of uh, initiatives. And as Kenneth has said, an academic publication will get you tenure it won't make any impact on any community. It really makes zero impact. You know, probably a handful of academics will read it, but very, very few, um, very few business people or, or people that you want to impact uh, will read it. So I do that in a number of ways. I, I write a, a blog uh, and I post it on LinkedIn and I get 20,000 readers uh, uh, a month that, that read it. Uh, I do uh, volunteer work. 
So I'm on a committee for standards with the American Standards and Technology Committee, ASTM. Um, during COVID, I served on the Joint Acquisition Task Force that was stood up by the White House to try to uh, find sources of PPE uh, that were in short supply. Uh, I worked with the FDA, the, the um, uh, Food and Drug Administration on supply chain resilience. I've worked with uh, the National Association of State Procurement Officers. We interviewed uh, procurement officers in every state in the country uh, to find out what they were doing to, to improve their resiliency. So this kind of activity uh, puts you in touch with people and uh, then they invite you to do things like, like webinars, like we're doing today. Um, they invite you to join, um, you know, maybe to, to, to be a, a potential interviewee for, for the media. And uh, for instance, uh, there's an organization called Informs, which is a, an academic institution, but they promote people who can uh, do uh, media interviews. And that's, I've been interviewed by the Washington Post, by NPR, the New York Times, simply because they introduced me to these reporters. So, you know, those are the kinds of things, you know, you need to get out there. And, uh, you know, you're, you, you're all very intelligent people and you're all experts in your own area. We, we are all experts in, in our area, but we have to talk to other people and let them know what our expertise is. So that would be sort of my advice for the group today. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So I'm going to still draw on, on some of the things that we've talked about recently before I kind of divert us slightly. So Kenneth and Rob, you've talked a lot about branding. Um, you've talked a lot about the importance of the brand. And I think it's definitely important, important that when you're cultivating your academic profile, you keep your brand in mind. But I, my question is twofold. Number one, can an academic be a separate brand and entity? So can you separate your academic profile from your brand? So can I be Foller and can I be Foller Enterprises one? And then the second question, which is the more important one for me personally, being Nigerian, how do you use your brand to make money? And I'm going to just draw on some of the experiences I've had, and then it would be great if everyone can just chip in. So obviously I have a legal background and I'm a practicing um, barrister in Nigeria. And how I've managed to do it is through the textbooks and the books that I've written. So I have three books that I've, I've written and I've used those. I've been able to cultivate my profile using those books. And those books have opened up doors, which have opened up consultancy gigs. They've opened up um, consultancy avenues. You get invitations. Can you come and speak at this? Can I interview for this? But I'm just wondering is and I'm, I'm asking for myself and, and probably everyone else in the room as well. How else can one use that brand to open up a, a bigger avenue of funding for yourself? And also, can you separate yourself from being a brand? So I think maybe we'll start, we'll start with Rob, then we'll go to Naren and then Kenneth. No, that's a great question. And, um, you know, I, I think the, the academic position that you have creates, um, and, and, and this is really where industry loves to engage with uh, faculty um, because it does show that you have an independent third party view. Um, you're, you're based on the truth. Uh, you're, you're based on, on empirical research. You're based on your experience and your observations of what's going on in the world. And, and that's something that's extremely valuable. And that's something that uh, business people and other people will value. So it's important to do both. Uh, and I think it's important to remain an academic, to remain someone who's dedicated to the, the truth and and uh, empirical research or, you know, facts and, and being able to, to use that as part of your brand. Um, people bring me, they call me to do consulting work because they want my point of view. They want me to, you know, to share with them what I've seen in other companies or, you know, to share with them what I think uh, a best practice is or, you know what what I observe is is being sort of the you know the the, the right the right thing to do or or what are what is going to happen in the next two years in supply chains you know i've I've had um, more notoriety in the last three years than I have in my thirty three year career. Uh, supply chain's been in the news, but and i've I've exploited that uh, because people do want to hear an expert. So I think it's important to have both. And, and to maintain that, that integrity. That's, that's number one 
that's the most important thing is your integrity. And that's that's really what people value. Fantastic, thank you. Narin? Um, okay, Felicia, let me ask you a question. When you brand yourself as a consultant, do you use doctor in front of your name and on your consultancy program and your consultancy bids? Who, myself? Yeah. Absolutely, I'm Nigerian. We love our titles. There you go. So you, 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 you. The bank yeah. when they miss, I say no. Actually, it's doctor. So absolutely. Yeah. So your brand and your identity as academic are so intertwined. Um, and I think that's the, they're intertwined because you couldn't do the consultancy had you not done the research in your academic life. So I don't think they can be separated. I definitely don't separate. Um, my reset my academic life from my any any consultancy work I do because I want them to know that I've done this in my academic life and this is the research I've done to make them aware of I'm an expert in this um, and as Rob says it goes back to integrity so you can prove your integrity through your work through academia because you have to jump hoops you have to go through ethics red tape just to carry out a little small type of research, whether it's qualitative, quantitative. So that helps substantiate the integrity part. But I know integrity is a lot bigger than that. Um, so I think it's very hard um, to, to dissociate one from the other. But I think in terms of making money, I do think um, that you can, like yourself, set up a, a separate consultancy. I know academics who, who I don't want to give the game away, but one 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 of my academic colleagues owns a boat through his extracurricular activities. Um, so that's how much he makes out of a consultancy. There's no way as an academic I could he could own a boat. Um, so I'm like, so he, he you know he's a registered business and he's um, doing it the right way. So he's not doing backhanders, not telling his employer. He's doing this separately and above and beyond, um, and he's. Pulled back, he's at the age and stage of his life where he can do 0 0.6 in his academic life and spend and justify that his consultancy, you know, private consultancy work is all his own money. And I think as academics, we need to be very careful. Again, I know I, I, I'm like a wet blanket um, because I'm going to say you have to check your academic contracts because not all academic jobs allow for you to take on a second role or have your own business unless it's not through the university, through commercialisation or patenting or IP or, you know, Edinburgh is great. I, I've heard of that, you know, what Kenneth was saying is one of the only universities that allow you to keep so much of the consultancy money. Um, you know, Dundee don't, Strathclyde don't, Glasgow, these are all universities I know and have been about. Um, they don't allow you to keep much of the money so I think you need to be very careful in how you approach that um, because you don't want to lose your academic job because all your time's been taken up by your private consultancy business so I think if you want to make money I, I do think check your contract make sure um, you speak to others who have done it um, and you know what there's huge opportunities for, for academics to consult um, and I think again it's going back to academics are very shy or they're scared to chap on doors. Um, and, and I think we need to do more of that, but just do it in the right way. God, I am a wet blanket. I'm really sorry. I'm putting a dampener on earning extra money because we're really badly paid as it is. But I just, you know, I'm a bit wary at my stage now that there's ways you can do it, but make sure you do it in the right way. But you can still gain so much advantage as an academic and bring that consultancy work into your academic life by writing a paper, by building an impact case study. Mm -hmm. Right, I'm, I'm actually going to come back to that issue of finance once I, I, I finish with Kenneth, so please share your thoughts okay. with us. Okay, uh, in, in the case of Edinburgh, uh, maybe things would have changed now because of Brexit and the austerity measure, but I hope uh, that's not the case. Um, so uh, the point about brand, uh, you, you asked a very good question there in terms of your individual brand and then the probably institutional brand. I've, I've always struggled with that myself, but I think um, as a black person, I think my institutional brand helps, especially if I am looking at, say, a white dominated environment. If 
I am looking towards Nigeria or Africa, for example. Sometimes people don't know the difference between Liverpool and any other university. For them, as long as they're in a UK university, that's fine. Okay. So I would say, um, but over time, you can also build, you know, think about uh, Michael Porter today. Any university he goes to, he's rather taking his own institutional, I mean, his own brand to that university to enhance the quality of the university. So, it's, so you come to a point where your brand stands on its own, but it has to be developed over time and conscientiously. So, but if you don't have that big brand, I think being with a big brand institution will help you. At least when people come to search on the website, they will find you, if not for anything, right? Then there is also it, um, the link with professional associations. I will encourage us all. It could be another way to showcase what we do. In Nigeria, for example, I, I started the association. It's now an institute, Sustainability Professional Institute of Nigeria, and I'm the president. So I literally know all the sustainability professionals in Nigeria. And when they're looking for sustainability strategy expertise, they gravitate towards me, especially from the knowledge side of things. I may not be the best, but at least being in Edinburgh and the things I do, uh, they help. So I would encourage us to be part of the professional uh, associations related to our disciplines. It helps. You talked about books. If you have teaching, good teaching textbooks, and they are targeted at undergraduates. You know, undergraduates will need time to grow in their career before they start inviting you <laughs> to help them. But if it's something targeted at executive education, so these are the people that will come, and the next day they will invite you to come to their organizations to help them. But I also think about book uh, bestsellers, for example. Dambisa Moyo finished her PhD at Oxford. She wrote a book, The Dead Age. Today, Dambisa Moyo is a brand. And that is invited. I mean, she's invited by corporates to sit on their board and so on and so forth. And keeps writing non-academic books, but academic but not, but for 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 the for the public. Um, um, Rob already talked about appearing in the media. You can also reach out. Sometimes we don't need to wait for the media people to contact us. I was in Nigeria last uh, two weeks ago. I called up uh, Arise. I said I was in town. Is it possible to interview me? And they did. I mean, I also spoke to Chinese television because these are the major television stations in Nigeria. I didn't wait for them. And then when they did it, I posted it on my LinkedIn. And do you know what happened? I've received some calls, even from the uh, 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 one of the senators to say, can you help me, right? Based on that interview. Uh, so the other thing also is when we choose our sabbatical, we come to that point, we have a year to spend. Please, if you're interested in um, entrepreneurship or being a consultant, don't spend your sabbatical in another university. You don't get anything. Right. <laughs> so right. I, when I had the chance to do my sabbatical, I did it with the National Pension Commission of Nigeria, and I was there with them for one year. And I, I can tell you, I built sufficient uh, network with the pension sector in Nigeria that I can leverage up. So if you're going to another institution, it's like having the same thing. Uh, all over again. So what's the point? So, I mean, I thought that would be something to mention in case people are thinking about their sabbatical. Don't do it in the university. Find a company, find somewhere else to do it. Thank you so much. And that's really helpful. And I think it really goes hand in hand with our theme, you know, thinking outside of the box. And I'm just going to draw, um, just before I move to the final questions, I think we're coming close to time, um, on some a point that Naurin made um, earlier, you know, not being afraid to actually ask for this help. Um, which sometimes it can be a bit daunting depending on it doesn't really matter which level of your career you're in because nobody wants to hear no and and that's sometimes some, something that can really um, have a substantial impact on you when you hear that no um, but that's just as an aside as I was going to uh, note that so just as I start to round up because I think we're coming close to time I still want to go back to this issue of finance because like I said I'm Nigerian and money is a big deal so Going back to this issue of finance, particularly for ECRs, mid-career um, level academics, what I've gotten so far from everyone is that you have to 
use the opportunities you have. So like Rob has in terms of his industry experience with the Bank of um, America in order to leverage it will leverage in on that to get to the position that he's in now. And so I guess my question is, how do we cultivate our thinking to tap into these financial rewards and how do we identify these potential entrepreneurial opportunities within our field and outside our field. So it would be great if we could give, if you can, all of the speakers can give us a summary, succinct points and strategies that you think might be helpful in order for us to translate what we have into finance. Thank you. So if we start with Rob, yes, please go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I'll then. jump in. Um, so, so I think it is important to, um, you know, maintain a wall between your academic uh, activities and your uh, consulting or, you know, for-profit uh, activities. And uh, the way I did that is I created a, a limited liability company, which is, it's just me, you know, and, and basically that allows, and I have a separate email for that account. Uh, every year, my university asks me to sign um, a conflict of interest statement, um, and I'm allowed to do, they encourage external consulting work uh, so long as it's limited to a certain number of hours per week. Um, I'm on a nine month salary, so the summers are mine. Um, but it's important you know, to abide by those requirements. You, you don't wanna be uh, you know, dipping, into, um, dipping into the tank and, and using time that's, that's allocated for your university. And, and I think overall, you know, your university work comes first. Uh, the consulting work is 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 nice, and it's nice to be recognized. Um, but you you need to keep a uh, you know kind of a a wall between the two activities and make sure they're distinct. Um, you know, one of the things I discovered years ago, I did some work for a company. Um, you know, it was for the, the movie industry, and I was looking at the benefits of the movie industry to the state. Uh, and uh, there were some right wing people that were very opposed to it. And uh, they came after me and they demanded a copy of all my emails. Fortunately, I'd used a different email server. And uh, so, you know, the, the university says you don't have access to his private emails. But technically speaking, the emails that if I had used the university email, they would have been able to disclose all of those, uh, all of those trend, all of those details. So, you know, having that distinction, I think is important. Um, you know, and, and that also allows you to have more flexibility in how you uh, can do external work for contracts and, and so forth without having to impinge on your university uh, requirements and responsibilities. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Narin, and then we'll come to Kenneth. Yeah, so I think Rob said about the, the consultancy and Kenneth will say more about the consultancy. Um, and I'll I'll just say it, I'll just touch quickly upon as an academic, you can increase your finances. You touched upon it earlier on, books, um, research bids and where you buy yourself out of, the, out of you know, teaching, for example, um, you buy yourself time. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not always financial, but you can buy yourself time. Um, books, as I mentioned, things like with incremental pay. Every university in the UK has incremental pay a year, but also accelerated pay points. So every year, universities, you can submit yourself um, and justify why you'd serve a £2,000 increase or a £5,000 increase. You can do that if you didn't know about that. It's HR policies across universities um, around the UK. Um, there's also things like some universities, and now Strathclyde does this, um, if you publish a four-star paper, they give you £2,000. Um, OK, it doesn't go directly into your bank account. I can't buy shoes. I can't decorate my house with it. But it's £2,000 maybe to go on a, a, a research conference um, above and beyond what they already give me, buy research equipment, buy kit. So, you know, there's different ways universities. So it might be worthwhile actually tapping into the resources, financial resources that your university already have, because business schools, um, especially business schools, are very rich rich schools and they prop up the rest of the university and they've always got money. You just need to look um, and ask the right questions and ask the right people about the financial resources available to you. Right, thank you. And Kenneth, sorry, just before you go, because we're running out of time, if I could just ask you to make it succinct. Thank you. You're muted. It's probably yeah, the most when it comes to, yeah, 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 yeah. When it comes to, to money matters, I think uh, Rob's point is very key. Make sure you are working within the parameters of your university. 
Um, there's no point making all the money and getting into trouble. There's no point doing that. Um, then the other thing in terms of if you want to keep make some money too, I find it useful to get the university to negotiate for you. So uh, if you do the negotiation yourself, sometimes you have short change, but because you are standing or you're building on the reputation of the university, the university can negotiate more for you. Um, but when the university becomes too expensive and it's something really you want to do for the experience, sometimes also you want to do and take a lower cost because you have a longer term interest. So there are different combinations. Uh, um, your academic job is still your primary job. Don't sacrifice it and don't allow your consultancy interest to then uh, come in the way. Uh, and for me in particular, I use consulting as a way to test my ideas. It's secondary, it's not primary, so that we don't uh, mischaracterize the role of um, consulting or being a, an academic entrepreneur. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you again to all of our speakers. Um, Adi, I'm going to pass back to you in case there are any questions from the audience and also online. Can we give them a round of applause? Like I said to you before, uh, money is very important, right? And uh, we are reaching that point as academics where we are beginning to feel the impact of, of the inflationary pressure on our pocket. So thank you so much to our speakers, uh, Professor Ron Anfield, Professor Kenneth Ameshi, and Dr. Adeyemi. Uh, Do we have any questions? So, uh, sorry, and Professor Nori Ashid as well. Sorry, Nori. Don't kill me after this, please. <laughs> Okay, do we have any questions from the audience? I would only maybe take one question. I'm really sorry because of time. We've got uh, Professor, um, uh, I forgot the name of my deputy director. <laughs> and right now, Hannah. Uh, MPPC, Dean of School, and uh, a professor I'm out of the room. So we really need to get on time. I'm pretty sure it's a Friday. You want to go on time as well, right? Okay, so one question for you, and that's it. Hello. Um, I won't ask you a lot to say as a question. It's more for a statement, contribution, and maybe a charge. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I think when we talk about EDI, we one of the reasons why EDI is important is that it allows us to meet people who we can easily relate to simply by having a look at it, simply by seeing them. And then I, would, I want to paint the picture so it makes a lot of sense where I'm coming from. So I'm from a minority within a minority, right? Um, I'm Nigerian, and then in Nigeria, I'm from a minority tribe, right? And um, for those of us from Nigeria, who Jam, recall we used to write ELDS, Education Less Developed Societies. So I'm from Bayelsa State. And um, Bayelsa State is one of the richest areas in terms of natural resources. However, um, there's a lot of things that could be better, that's putting it simply. And why am I going with this? Um, what we look for, a lot of what everyone has said here reflects on mentorship. And that's, that's the key takeaway for me from here. And it's one of the things I've struggled with the most um, because um, sometimes finding a mentor can be difficult. Finding someone you can really can be difficult, which is why I'm very appreciative of this conference. So what I'm trying to point out is for, for some of us, it has been tougher to find mentors. And then the charge is, that for those of us who can provide the mentorship opportunities, either in, the, in whatever area that you can, please open the doors. I know it is tough and I know everyone is busy, but please open the doors. That's, that's I think, the major thing I want to just highlight here. That um, it's not else to say it. We actually have to realize that we need to do it because people genuinely need this help. The addition to that, which I will make is, um, which I think is a question for everyone who has spoken here. What is the scope of mentorship? What should the scope of mentorship be? Where does it start and where does it end? So that mentees themselves know where the boundaries are. And at the same time, they know the kind of support that they can get from within and without, so to speak. So, awesome. Thank you very much. Do you want an answer to that? Do we need an answer to that? Or should we? Yeah. Okay. 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 Do we want to? I think we'll pass this over to Rob, actually. I, I'd be interested to hear his insights, if that's OK. Sorry to put you on the spot. 
Rob, you have to unmute yourself, Rob. Make sure I understand the questions. Your question was, you know, the, the extent to which, you know, having uh, energy resources in a com in a country like Nigeria and how how do we uh, how do we focus on, you know, working on those? Is that is that correct? I I think in addition, I think the question touches on the scope of mentorship and trying to identify that. Did I get that I right? I yeah. see. OK, yeah. So so in terms of mentorship, you know, I, I obviously uh, finding a good mentor is 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 very critical. And, um, you know, finding someone that that you respect, that that you'd like to be, you know, like uh, someone that you you look up to, someone that uh, uh, is the kind of person that eventually you want to be. And I, I was fortunate to early in my career to find a couple of really, uh, really good mentors. Um, one was um, uh, Robert Monska at Michigan State, where I was a young professor there. And when I when I saw what he was doing, you know, I I studied what he did and I, I followed uh, in his footsteps. And when I went to NC State, I, I created something similar, which was a, a, a supply chain uh, center. And uh, it started very, very slowly. But, you know, one of the things I observed with 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 Bob was that he uh, the relationships were really important. The, the relationships you build with people along the way are, are critical. And uh, it, it's it's important to, you know, I always say to people never, never shut the door on a relationship. You never know when you're going to see that individual again. It's it's a relatively small circle. So so find a good mentor, find someone that you can talk to. Uh, and stay in touch with, and uh, and build relationships. You know, stay in touch with people, um, and and especially you know important people, and because very often they they really enjoy talking to academics. They like to share what's going on, and and they like to share their lives, and and very often they want your they value your perspective because uh, you're not tied to a company. You don't want something, and I think those are all really important points. Hopefully that. Right. That was helpful. Yeah, thank you. Back thank to you, you very Ed. much, Ron. Thank you for that today. Thank you, Kenneth, and thank you, Noreen, for what a fantastic thank session. Uh, I think uh, overall, I picked up a couple of points on this session, which, which sort of relates to my own um, sort of tactic, I would say, lately, right? The first point was about getting out there and not limiting ourselves to the academic environment. I think that's very important. I, I didn't even know this at all until last year, I had the opportunity to go to Parliament, so I was House of Commons, speak to MPs, and the thing was actually there. It was probably the only academic that attended that session. It was a very close round table, right? We were probably about 15, some MPs, uh, and some key industry leaders, so guys from Anglican, from Associated British Food stock people in, 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 in industry came. You know, and we're talking about, you know, uh, sustainability and building resilience in the food supply chain. So the people don't think I noticed from that particular session, you know, that actually we are very good at what we do, but we are very scared sometimes to go outside to speak to people. But we got very tactical at the same time. So I, I, I mean, what, what did I notice? After the session, Two of the MPs came to me and said, what a fantastic talk you had here. Because I was an academic speaker and uh, the director of logistics at Coca-Cola was an industry speaker. And the guy said to me, you don't read your academic articles. You know? <laughs> we don't even have access to your academic articles. So if you really want to make me, as an MP, who's got loads of things to worry about, read your work, you've got to put it on a one page, sharp, straight to the point, and I can read that on the train going to work in the morning. And then you could begin to link with industry and make money that way. And of course, link to the university. And since that time, I think I've been very careful how I write my work or where I put my work. So of course, I'm still an academic. I should put my work, I should try to put my work in four star or three star or whatever star papers. But lately, I've been very tactical to ensure I put my work in um, um, industry. Uh, outlets as well. And for example, a very good example was re recently I went to Nigeria. I, I got a CITCOM internal funding here at the University of Leicester. Went to Nigeria to conduct some research. 
got a lot of data. I was thinking to myself, ah, what should I do now? Should I then begin to write this whole stuff paper that will take me four years to write? Or could I just maybe put this piece, which is a very important, very crucial topic for Nigeria at the moment. We have a shortage of maize in Nigeria. Should I put that out where it could make impactful work? And maybe one way, indirectly or indirectly, I could get contacted by somebody in Nigeria, either through the government or industry. And I put that out in the World Economic Forum, and it got accepted for publication, right? And we could begin to think like that, to say, look, apart from academic publications, how else can we put our work outside that will begin to make impact? So I think I really learned a lot from you guys today, and I'm hopeful that everybody here as well learns something. Did we do? Yes. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Rob, Rob, Rob joined us from North Carolina. He's joining us from Rob. Rob, what's the time in North Carolina at the moment? It's uh, 10.45 here this morning. Wow. So, yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you, you, thank you so, much. so much. Thank you. And thank Kenneth, you. what's the time in Italy? I know you're in Florence at the moment. Uh -huh. Yes, it's quarter to five in the afternoon. So that's fine. Okay. Wow. <laughs> and for Lashale in Lagos, I'm sure the time thank is... You. Lagos in Lagos. to me in Lagos, in sunny Lagos. It's quarter sunny to Lagos. Five. Okay. And uh, uh, Noreen is joining us from Glasgow, I would imagine, yes? Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you again. Thank you. So I have five minutes with refreshment break. Do we still need that or should we go straight into the last session? We've got our speakers here. Huh? Straight into it. Okay, so uh, our last session is on leveraging, sorry. Our last session is on the, the, the art of crafting a global academic profile. In this session, we have three speakers and one moderator. Our first speaker is our provost and um, deputy vice chancellor, Professor Henrietta O'Connor, who is one of the leaders of our university. Uh, we also have Professor Dan Bradley, who is the um, dean of our business school, the dean of the University of Delta Business School, and also he also of this event, and we have Professor Joseph Aman Amoa, who is the Professor of uh, International Business at the University of Durham. Kent Durham, he's, he's, he's moving to Durham uh, uh, in a few weeks. And our moderator for this session is Dr. Timoron T. Romani Nadan. So, T. Romani, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, do I get the clicker? Or you do it? Uh, yeah, you can do it. Thanks. Do we go straight or do we have people coming, joining? Straight up. Yeah, okay. Sorry, did I miss? Did you did the intro, yeah, right? Yeah, that's good. So, good afternoon, everyone. I know I'm between the you going home on Friday thing, so we're going to kind of wrap it up. You tell me the time of day because we're starting late whenever you want me to finish. So, welcome, uh, speakers. So, we're going to touch into you. We've spoken about promotion earlier. We've uh, uh, spoken about entrepreneurship and everything. And obviously, it's also visibility. There was a word that came quite a lot. And now we're going to talk about how do we go into a global academic profile. I'll be tossing the same mic, if that's all right with you. So my first question actually would be if you could give me a brief intro about your pathway, as in where you did your PhD, because I tried to look you up a bit. <laughs> but there was limited, uh, limited info. I couldn't get much about you, uh, Dan, unfortunately. We yet to be connected on LinkedIn. So if you could just give me briefly one minute each where you did your PhD and when, just so um, the audience can understand from where you come in and how many years of experience you've got in the sector. Thank you. OK, uh, I'm Joseph. I started my PhD. Uh, uh, I first started at Brunel. And my supervisor moved on to Swansea, so I moved along with him. So I finished in 2010, and then I took up a job lectureship at University of Bristol. And then from Bristol, I moved to Kent, and now I'm on my way out of Kent to out of Kent, okay, to Durham. Oh, so good. 
Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Henrietta O'Connor. Um, I did my first degree at Queen Mary University in London in geography. Then I went to Trinity College in Dublin to do a PhD straight after my degree, but I didn't finish it as a PhD. I didn't, uh, there were many reasons for it, but I came to Leicester as an exchange student. I came from Dublin back to Leicester as an exchange student and I wrote my PhD up as an MPhil. And then I got a job at Leicester as a, um, a course tutor on an HRM degree programme and I started my PhD much later. So I started my PhD after having two children and working full time at the University of Leicester. So I finished my first degree in 1990 and I didn't start my PhD, PhD until 2000 and three and I finished it in 2006 so I came quite late to having a PhD although I'd had an academic career before that and I've been at Leicester ever since. Thank you, uh, I'm still going hardly. Um, I did my first degree, my undergraduate degree in computer science in 2001 to 2004 at the University of Leeds and then from did my PhD 2004 to 2008 at which point I came here as a lecturer in finance and have been here ever since. Thank you. I'm just going to quickly say, Tom, could you put the first question to our audience there online? If you could tell us a bit about where they're coming, uh, because obviously we're talking about global practice and it would be good to know where our audience is coming from and where they want to go to. Sorry, next slide, Tom. Yeah. Yeah, next, next, where it has the red. Yeah, next, not that, next. Yeah. Um, anyway, my question to the panel is, who would you describe as an academic with a pro global profile reputation? Or what are the traits? You've got the mic. Do you want to be <laughs> <laughs> are, you, are you looking for a particular person or? Um, in your experience, who would you see as someone who has got a global uh, academic profile? Um, OK, so I think in my field, I think what gets you a global academic profile, Janet, is papers. I mean, it's unambiguously that I think is what builds your profile globally. It's not necessarily the same thing that gets you promoted, not necessarily it's the same thing that would get you a job, but I think you know, certainly within business, the thing that gets you a profile globally is papers and how often they're, they're cited. We've actually heard about the business call demands earlier, so. <laughs> papers, OK. Um, how about you, Professor? I'd agree with Dan. I think there's this kind of superstar global academics have all have that in common, that they have a really firm grounding in their own discipline, a really highly thought of. I think back in the day, I would say it was that sort of international conference circuit. And then increasingly, as your profile becomes established, you start to get invited to give higher profile papers at higher profile conferences. But what I've noticed more recently, and it touches on the, the previous theme actually, is about the um, brand, academics with a brand. I'm the furthest from that you can imagine, I think. It's made, it's made me think about how to build a brand. But what I see increasingly is people with a, a strong social media brand who have become academic superstars, maybe with, maybe with a less well-established academic background than we saw in the past, but they have a strong voice, a strong brand thousands to, to maybe uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of followers on social media. And those academics now have become, to my mind, sort of um, superstar academics for various reasons. Thank you. Okay. So when I was asked to sit on the panel, I felt I was not qualified enough to think, to talk about this particular topic, because I've always seen myself as very local in terms of what I'm doing. But for me, in terms of a global academic profile, I would look for somebody that has pioneered some kind of an idea mm -hmm. in a particular field. So in my own field of international business, it could be maybe mergers and acquisition, it could be business failure, whatever. But I always look for somebody who has pioneered a particular idea in that particular domain, and that idea has gained prominence. Mm -hmm. And that's what I would look for. Thank you. My next question actually kind of, um, sorry for online people to hear. My next question is a bit kind of hurrying forward this, you kind of answer a bit. Now, what does it entail to become an academic with a, a global profile and how can academics increase their visibility? You said about being a superstar, I like that word. So how do you increase your visibility challenge this and what are the incremental steps? I think the most important there also 
needed to be taken uh, from ECR to senior academy, professor, dean, you know, higher levels. We'll stop. Uh, for me, I think the starting point is that you need to establish some kind of distinctive domain as an academic. Mm -hmm an area that you are known for, maybe you're known for doing research on social media or doing research on digital marketing. And I think once you have that distinctive domain, then you can build on from there. Uh, I see a lot of people posting a lot of information on social media about a particular topic, but when I, sometimes you follow what they posted about and you realize, okay, this person, there's not really an underlying kind of research and and opinion what they've been posting about but when you see somebody who's been posting a lot of information and you see a lot of work about that the person has conducted before then i think that person's reputation but you begin to have a more positive view of that pe person's reputation and i think that goes a long way in terms of uh, developing a global uh, academic reputation and do you have anything else to add on the incremental steps obviously You've kind of had careers around 20 years <laughs> you've often. Uh, I think for 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 me, in terms of incremental step, I would say because in business and management, people value research. People look, people look if you mention any academic, often when you Google them and you go to your website, the first thing you are looking for is the research of that person. I'm sure we have a lot of people in this. You Google somebody, you, you want to see their research. So I think as an incremental step, if you are early career person, I would say if you dedicate your effort in terms of building up your research profile, I think over time all the other elements will, will come into play. I think you should could pass the mic. And... Yeah, I think I agree with all those points. I think um, Adi made a really good point earlier about making academic work accessible. Mm -hmm. And I think we all sit and write papers, but maybe the people we want to read them aren't reading them. So maybe that's the policy makers or the politicians or other people out there. So I think a really good way to get the message out there and to establish your profile is to start alongside the academic articles, finding other sources of getting your outputs out there. And often, I think as an early, even as a very early career researcher, university press offices will help you. If you've got a good story, if you've got some research with some kind of impact, the university can't wait to help you to do that because then that case can develop into an impact case study further down the line. You start building the evidence early on. And I think that really helps you to get your profile out there. At the same time, where, whatever university you work at, I would urge you to get media training. I think most universities put on media training and once you start to become established in your own field, you will start to get invitations, maybe first just to small conferences, later on to do radio interviews, onto television interviews. If you've got that training behind you, I think it will give you great confidence to, to accept invitations and to continue to increase your profile. Thank you, Mr. I think there's an element of timing as well. So, you know, being aware of the, what's going on in the wider world and how your research connects to that. So the biggest successes I've had in terms of international um, impact have been when I've been able to time re releases of my research around what was going on in the wider world. So, for example, I had a paper on the role of uh, hormones and male versus female traders in financial markets that happened to be completed and the press release was ready on International Women's Day. As a result of that paper going out, it was picked up in The Times, The Australian, I Republica. I got told on to BBC Worldwide News and that was because it, of the day it hit. You know, I've got no doubt. So it was a nice paper, it was some nice results. If I'd released it a week later, maybe it would have got picked up a little bit. I don't know, but right story, right day. Um, being aware of what's going on in the world can have a huge impact. Thank you. Um, you can keep the mic because the next question is for you. <laughs> now, um, what does it take to become uh, a university leader, a VC, a DVC, a dean of school? And um, for you, when the question comes to you, if you could obviously I have high hopes for you as well. So tell us what are the steps you're taking. So if you would start with. Um, it's a really interesting question. So I suspect um, Henrietta and I will probably have this in different ways because we've had our own unique paths here. Um, I think there's an element of, I think, so if I look at my career, the, the way that I've sort of got 
promoted in terms of academic roles, so I've done various senior roles before this one, was um, a willingness to take responsibility for things. There's a huge amount of roles within schools, within universities, and things need doing. Quite often there's, you know, so I'll give you, if we give an example, so course leadership, you know, there's, it's a role, I'm sure many people, many academics here have, have led a course, have met, we've got many course leaders in the school, I've done it in the past. I think what helps you in your career, what helps you to regress and to, to be recognised is not that you've had that role, but what you do with it, you know, what impact can you show you've made in that role? And I think you know, being able to do that consistently, taking responsibility for things, not just holding a role, but saying, okay, how can I make things better? I think is incredibly important in these roles. So let's say the willingness to take responsibility for, for what's going on around you, particularly when you, know, you can't always control it. You know, you can, um, there's all sorts of things going on that are impacting you've got to respond to, but that willingness to, to take responsibility and to sort of care about, you know, the, the school, the department, the university you're in. If you don't, it's very hard, I think, to, to bake it and to invest the time in it. But there is a trade-off there. You know, I think what we were just talking about, research. I know I've sacrificed a huge amount of research time to do these roles. Um, I, fundamentally, I think it's for two reasons. Firstly, I care about school. Secondly, I, I enjoy it as well. You know, I, I like you know, looking after the school. It's, um, it's an incredible privilege. And you know, quite happy to spend hours a day sat in meetings because I can see the, the benefits to the to the school. Yeah, again, I'd agree with Dan's points. But when I think back, I think it's about taking the opportunities that come your way, even if they don't necessarily seem that appealing. I, I tend to find the things that I don't want to do. <laughs> I volunteer to do them anyway, and then I get interested in them. Um, and then I become enthusiastic and enjoy doing that. But I think the key thing I would probably say is about how you relate to other people and wanting to help other people and support other people at the same time as them helping and supporting you. And it's kind of creating that circle of, I suppose it's almost like a circle of trust. Someone will know, OK, I can ask Henrietta, I know she'll do it, but then I will play that forward and ask somebody else to help me or I will offer to help them. I don't know if that makes sense, but it's it's kind of about setting up those networks and making sure that you are helping others and they are helping you. And I, that, that has served me very well to always um, hope that I'm supporting others with their career and hope that somebody else is helping me with my career. I suppose that that's my final point on this question is you never know who's helping you. There are often people, whatever stage you're at, there are often people behind the scenes who are pulling strings for you or influencing your career. If you do something to help somebody else, you can almost guarantee that that person will then speak of you in a very positive way at the next level meeting. And then the next person at the next level meeting will remember your name and then you'll be given other opportunities. And for me, that that seems to always work very well for myself, but for the people who I, I'm supporting as well. So it's kind of soft skills, but actually those are important. For me, the way uh, my pathway through academic leadership, initially I was not willing to take on other admin roles and a number of senior people at the time came to me and drew my attention to the fact that, and this ties in with the point that some of the panel members made earlier about promotion, that in many universities, the promotion criteria, you needed to have done some big admin role. So the way I started was, OK, I started developing programs. So at Bristol, I was involved in developing master's program for international business. And when I joined Kent, I was devo I developed two master's program as well. So and I think those programs did well. And then I was dragging into other roles and I was asked to take other more significant roles within the university. So my last role at Kent was that I was uh, associating for research. Um, it's actually a question directly to you now. How about um, becoming a leader when you an international staff? Like not come, not being born here, how, how uh, for example, uh, people who are not oh, here, becoming a thing here? Oh, oh yeah. So, no, I was asking the same question before international staff. For, 
uh, to become a leader. Uh, for me, I think I'm more, I tend to focus on the role that I'm giving and try to do my very best in that role. And I hope that once I perform in that role, it will then lead on or somebody in the university will see uh, the way I perform in that particular role. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mike, okay, now question to you both. How about people who are uh, from professional services? Um, having you from professional services to academia. I knew I was sat next to Stella. I'm putting you on the dot here. Uh, and how many other people we have here who are not academics? Uh, not many? Okay, we have a few. Stella yourself as well, right? And we've had a few people, I think they've left already. So if you could um, just maybe from your experience on what you've seen in the department, the university. OK, this is something I'm really passionate about as a university, any university. You can't make progress without professional services and academics working together. It's absolutely crucial. And I know that there are sometimes there are academics who don't see the value of professional services or don't understand that actually often it's professional services staff who can hold the key to your career. So often it's professional services who will tell the VC, oh, you need to speak to that academic. They will they'll be able to answer this. They'll be able to do that for you. So working together, with professional services staff is absolutely crucial and as an academic making sure that professional services staff get the recognition they deserve and have the pathways available to them and I'm going to give you a recent example of that I've only recently been appointed as provost and deputy vice chancellor at Leicester I started in August a year before I was appointed, the vice chancellor appointed a deputy vice chancellor for professional services. So we have a Leicester, of, uh, I think it's a unique model in the sector. We have a deputy vice chancellor of professional services and a deputy vice chancellor in provost. And we are working really closely in partnership. And it's, it's astounding. I mean, it's, it's not, but it is that everything that we do overlaps. And if we don't work together effectively, we can't operate effectively as a university. So. Um, I think the, the kind of the route to promotion for professional services is the same as I outlined for academics. It's about working with other people, making sure there are strong relationships that are beneficial across the university and making sure that everyone gets recognised for the skills that they're bringing. Thank you. If you could answer this. Thank you. Um, yeah, I completely agree with that. So arguably my most important relationship in the university is with my head of operations in the school. We work together. To, to manage the school because everything we do, you know, research, teaching, enterprise, student support, it overlaps both, both parts of the, the school. So having a good relationship, having productive relationship, a relationship of equals is absolutely crucial. Thank you. Um, almost bad. Um, Ade, I'm trying to find Ade. Are we good on time, right? Uh, no. uh, Mercy, can I ask you, sorry, I'm putting Mercy on the spot now, if she's seen me, she yeah, can have, you. Um, have we got anything from who, the people who are joining us online, where are they from? Uh, no one, okay. So we are, we are people from Nigeria, Dubai. Okay. So global, so. Um, now, UK uh, as well. Okay, good. Uh, now, I've actually got a question uh, for you, Professor O'Connell. You said earlier about um, media training uh, when we were talking about visibility. Now, yourself, what's been your experience with that when you had it and uh, the other two as well, if you've had it, when was that? How was it? How is it helping you? And what would be your advice to people who are starting up now? Because obviously media training, most of the universities spend money on people who are on SLT or thing or you know, higher up for uh, leadership, which where media training comes a lot into play. Now, how, what would you say to someone who's starting, um, you know, those incremental steps in media training? If you want to answer first or OK, uh, for me, uh, what drew my attention to social media, LinkedIn and other platforms was some academics started sending me information demonstrating strong correlation between posting information on social media and getting citations. So that prompted my attention and then I decided, OK, to sign up to some of the courses that were being run across the university in other places. I was thinking in the previous session, there was a lot of talk about having a brand yeah. and how you establish your brand and how you get your name out there. And it made me think about personality types. And I think for some people, that's very easy. Some people really like being in front of the camera. They like doing those very extrovert things. 
many of us are the opposite and I am quite the opposite. I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm doing this, but I'm actually quite an introverted person. So although I said all that stuff about media, I hate doing it. I, I absolutely hate it. So I do try and I do have to do it. One of my recurring nightmares is that I have to go on something like Newsnight and, and, and I get really stressed about it. So my advice would be do media training early and take all the opportunities to do things in front of the camera or in a kind of podcast situation, because like everything else, it's one of those things that the more you do it, the better you get. I think the value of the training is they, I think the people who are experts in this will train you to answer questions like a politician, actually, to work out how to spin it, to say what you want to say, rather than what you might actually be thinking you're going to say. So yeah, get the training early and just keep practicing. Take those opportunities in your day to day work to, to do those kind of radio interviews and that kind of thing. And then when the big opportunities come, you'll feel more confident. Thank you. Um, yeah, I've not had media training. Um, I wish I had. So uh, I mentioned I did a TV interview for BBC Worldwide. Now, the interesting and the advantageous thing of doing one for BBC Worldwide is it sounds great. Plus, it's global. It went all the way around the world. People in every country saw it, except fortunately not this one. <laughs> so no one I knew saw my interview, which is really good because it's incredibly cringeworthy. Um, I really needed training before that. And it's yes. We didn't get it, so I highly recommend it. Get the mic. Um, next slide, please, um, Thomas. Yeah. Um, next one as well. Um, now, just maybe a little tip. There are loads of free courses, by the way, for media training. If you are an early career researcher on professional services and your institution is not spending on you, there are other alternatives out there. And I can pass these info to Ali and he can post on the link in and website and stuff like this. Um, now, the next question is actually to you, um, which is about well, women, we don't have it cut out quite for us easily already. And since we're talking of media and all now, what are some of the challenges you found that going up and being in the in the state where the the, um, the place where you are now, especially you know, sustaining and even gaming I higher and becoming a global uh, uh, academic with you know a global profile, where women usually we even you know what shoes are is she wearing you know what top is she wearing we don't tend to get that comment sometimes for uh, males who are out there in the global arena. I mean we've seen the female. Um, uh, Prime ministers and other women who are, you know, in the global space, the type of comments and uh, slurs also that also get uh, talked about them in, in social media. So what have been some of your challenges yourself? And if you have tips for women who are aiming to go there. So if, if by the way, if we have question most here around that, you can uh, send out as well and we'll tackle that now. Thank you. Okay, I think when I first joined the exec board at Leicester, I was the only woman on the exec board um, and I, I was quite conscious of that. I didn't let it impact me too much, but I was conscious of it, but I was conscious of it in the sense that I wanted I, I wanted other women to feel able to follow what I was doing. So I, even though sometimes it was tough, I felt like it was the right thing to do. It, it was about, it was about me and my own career. Of course, there is some kind of selfish part in there, but there's also that thing of some somebody needs to be here somebody needs to speak speak for women in this context and actually it was always fine the things i found quite difficult and the tips that i've got are in in meetings i i as particularly early on i made sure that i spoke early that i had something to say early in the meeting because i found that if i didn't speak early in the meeting i'd be too intimidated to say anything at all and the meeting would end and i wouldn't have said a word so i prepared really well and made sure i had something to say very early on in the meeting and that then i found has always given me confidence to then it's almost like owning the room at the beginning and then you feel more able to come in later if you leave it it's very hard the biggest challenges i have found i've got three children and i found that more challenging in terms of things like all of you with children will understand this when one of your children is having a difficult time or they have chicken pox or um, they all come down with an illness one after the other and they always get ill on the day you're supposed to be flying off somewhere to to do a conference or to um i found that very challenging I've, i don't have family in leicester 
so that I didn't have an easy option with those things. And I found I have found that quite challenging over the over the years. Um, I found ways through it, but I think that that is that remains difficult in in different in different ways. There are ways through it. I think things like Athena Swan have helped with that. It's helped people to be able to say things like um, I can't be there. It's my child's first day at school, um, but it's not that's not always easy. I was going to say something else about that then. Um, the other thing that I've recognised over the years and for everybody, I think this is true. Your career tends to go in peaks and troughs. And sometimes I've accepted that my career is in a kind of almost a lull for a short period because I've just come back from maternity leave or one of my children is having a hard time or something's not working for me in the department I'm in. So in those opportunities, either I've accepted there's a slight lull, but it won't be forever. It'll come back. Um, or I've looked outside of my institution for different opportunities and taken those points where there's been a lull because I haven't necessarily, how do, how do you put it, when you have a line manager who doesn't necessarily recognise your strengths and you can see that you're at a bit of a, a, a dead end in a current situation, I've looked outside the organisation and strengthened my links outside, which later on has then helped when things have got back on track. So it's accepting that sort of peaks and troughs, I think. Thank you. If you want to add something as well, please. Uh, now, my next question, uh, next slide, please, uh, Tom. Um, now I tried to look you up on, on LinkedIn. I think it's, it's. Um, I, I couldn't find any gap in career, but when you, you did introduce, you did say something about even, you know, uh, starting a PhD and then having a break in there. Now, have you had a career break? And what is your advice to those who have had career break? For example, caring for sick parents, sick kids, uh, you know, elderly family, or it, we've even seen the pandemic recently. We've realized how much it is, how important it is, uh, you know, to give time also to our loved ones. And there seems also like redundancy. Um, so how, if you've had career, if, if you've had career break, and what will be your advice to people or your own uh, pathway through that, how, how you did that to keep, continue to keep uh, a global profile and your scholarship going on, how how you maintain that during that career break? You can start if you've had a career break, no. who has something to share? <laughs> I, I've not had any uh, career break. So, okay. so if, if you were to have one, how would you maintain that? So we'll, we'll, uh, yeah, you know, like uh, we've had pandemic or something like this, right? We've we've in certain things we've slowed down. So I think for me, oh, sorry, you have to uh, the, my nature. I think I need to continue to work. <laughs> you know, uh, I always feel that if I don't continue to work, I will go backwards. You know, uh, you know when you're born poor, you always fear. The fear is what keeps you moving yeah. forward. So I always have that at the back of my mind that yes, I need to continue or I'll go into reverse. I'm not sure if that helps. <laughs> uh, uh, you've, you've touched on something very important here because fear and poverty, especially, you know, we, we are in a group of SBA here, we know that very well. And it pushes you to strive even, you know, when out of job or everything, you're still trying, 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 trying to. So yeah, you've kind of answered what. What did you, uh, if you could pass the mind now, please. I think I would say the thing that's made a difference to me, I have had three three career breaks, a short one, a slightly longer one, and then a longer, uh, longer one with my third child. The thing that's made a difference to me is always working in teams. So I haven't been a person, a lone scholar ever in my career. I've always worked with other people. And that's where I, the, working as a team has been really beneficial because when you do that, there's always a time when somebody is out of the workplace for some reason or another, whether it's maternity leave or caring for elderly relatives or that your own sickness. And then when, if you're in a good high functioning team, the others will pick up the slack knowing you're going to come back. And that's what's always worked for me. And it's man I've managed to maintain my publication record despite having periods of leave because I did the work before I went. Other people picked it up. And when I came back, you kind of hit the ground running. It's, it's not straightforward, but that that has definitely helped me. Thank you. So I've not had a career break, but I think the closest I've had is the last few years I've had. Well, I'm not telling. 
I'm not sure I should say the same thing to my boss. Um, I've effect, to some extent had a, a research break. So the, the administrative roles just take so many hours that trying to, you know, I can see the difference between how I was doing research up until about 2018, 2019, and then the three or four years, five years since then when I've been in much more encompassing leadership roles and the time isn't there to do uh, the same volume of research. I think Henrietta's point on Teams is absolutely spot on, that most of my research I do with co-authors, um, means I can work with them, there's always one of us progressing it. I think I've had to rationalise my pipeline of papers as well. So I used to work, so at the start of my career I made mistakes, I was working on a dozen papers at once and that's not a productive or sensible way to do it. I think an analogy of sort of a plate spinning, you know, you're just running between one and one, everyone, you never make any progress on any of them. In the middle of my career up to now, um, I got that down to three or four and that was quite a good position. I could, you know, make progress on each of them. I felt like I was getting somewhere. Now I'm working on one or two at once. I'm almost working on them in serial. And I have to be very honest with my co-authors saying, yes, your, pa your paper is important to me, but I will get to it when I can. It's, I'm working on this one, this is going to take me two months, then I've got to do that one, yours is next in the queue. It will be, I will do it, but I am just slower now. Thank you, if I, if I may um, just actually um, slightly, slightly add to right. that. So as you know, Dean of, of the school now and yourself, uh, Prof. O'Connor as, as Deputy VC, if you have a staff who comes to you now and is looking, you know, very ambitious, <laughs> very ambitious and looking for, uh, but have had a career break in the last few years. And what would be your way of going about with that person? We've heard tips from your own life. What would be your tips to to your staff uh, to maybe pointing them to some department or uh, yourself providing some some guidance? What what would that be? Um, so I think there's a whole range of things we can do here. I think uh, it was mentioned in the at the end of the previous session. I think other times as well the importance of mentoring, having people that you can talk to about your career. Because I, everyone's career is different. Um, you know, if I go back 15 years, I didn't see my career going to here at this particular point. So it's about finding someone who can who you can talk to about your career, where you want to go to, and that they can provide you advice. As the dean of the school. I can hopefully help put you in a position or give you the support where you can do what you want. It's not always possible, but that is part of my my role to help people succeed and to you know, find the resources, find the opportunities for them so that they can progress with their career. I think one thing that we did badly in the school and that we you know, we put a lot of work into changing recently is how do we support people coming back from career mm -hmm. breaks? Um, I know I think the thing that really spurred me on to fix it this was a story from my deputy who when she came back from a um, maternity leave basically didn't get any form of reinduction no one the head of de uh, department at the time who was no longer with us you know, um, I didn't really do a you know, welcome back sort of thing she just started again which was far from ideal so we put off the time and working to provide some sort of, you know structure for that and that's hopefully something we're going to be rolling out in the coming weeks and months. Okay, yeah, that's good news. Some change that's positive. Okay. Your subject have um, Yeah, I haven't really got anything to add. I'd say the same as Dan. I'd say it's about support and making sure as a senior leader you are there to support people coming back. I know some universities have got more resource than others. So in some universities there are um, less financial support for people coming back from career breaks to get them back into back into work again. Other universities haven't got that, but there are other opportunities for different support networks that, that I would say the same. Thank you. I've got a quick question actually for those who are attending from, did you say Dubai um, and a few places, uh, Nigeria and uh, UK, right? So if you could go to the next slide, um, Tom, yeah, the one where we had the questions. If they could tell us if they've had career breaks and what they are doing to keep global practice, especially those who are currently in Dubai and uh, Nigeria. Now, I wanted also to ask whoever here, we seem to have not just people of early careers here, but if we have anyone 
uh, who would like to add to this one. Uh, and obviously here when I'm talking of career break, it's not just for women, it's also for men who may have taken career break. That's why I put the pandemic also uh, into uh, the picture here. Does anyone have anything else to add that we may have missed here on the panel? And at the moment, it's Friday. <laughs> OK, um, well, we'll see what's online, what they are sharing and how they are, um, how they are doing with um, next one. Sorry, next term. Um, yeah, that was the next. Is it the last one? Yeah, that's another last question I prepared then. So I'm just going to ask questions from the floor and questions online. If anyone has questions yeah, yeah. for our panel. I'll, I'll give you the, the mic so everyone hears you. And the first question is, who would you consider to be a global academic? Is it uh, someone with five for star papers or someone with over 100 followers on Twitter? <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's the first question. And um, the second question is around So, do you have any tips on dealing with challenges or even mistakes? Because one of the things that holds people back to take on new roles is them being scared of take, making mistakes. So, do you have tips on how they can deal with mistakes or challenges? So, we've got two questions from the online participants, and you the closest. So, my okay. Um, so I'll answer one than the other. So I think in regard to the first question, this is something I've thought about quite a lot. So in the 18 months, two years that I've been dean of the school, I've hired 90 per, uh, permanent academics into the school, of which about 20 are professors. So I've, yeah, I think I've got, I also have some evidence to demonstrate what, what I do here. And so I've thought a lot about this. So if I'm thinking about professors, Papers are important. You know, the you know having a, a record of four-star papers is important, but that's essentially necessary but not sufficient. Okay, that will you know that will help to get you on the shortlist. What I'm really interested in, though, to you in you know, is so much broader than that. You know, I want to see that you you care about teaching. You know, our students, you know, central to the university. I've got to see that you care about that. I also need to see that you're a leader and that can mean a whole different set of things. You know, I remember asking one candidate a question about uh, mentoring and their response was something along the lines of, well, if they come to me and they want to write a paper with me, we'll talk, otherwise I'm probably not the best person. That's, sorry, that's not going to get you the job as a professor. You know, you're a leader, you're a leader to those around you, to junior researchers to be supporting them. If you can be a leader more broadly than that, you can take responsibility for large bits of the schools. That's incredibly attractive for some to be hired. You know, it's something that's very, very hard to get. And that, you know, find people who can do that, you know, to accept or move mountains to hire them. Because it's such a valuable skill. And that runs in nicely to your, your second question of the fear of making mistakes. We all make mistakes. I'm, I make mistakes incredibly often. <laughs> the, I think the important thing is this willingness to take responsibility for your actions. You, know, you will make mistakes. That's fine. But if they were done through you know, an error of judgment, you listen, that's fine. You know, take responsibility for it. Try hard. Succeed. You know, sometimes you'll make mistakes. That's not a problem. You know, we all make mistakes. Yeah, on that same question about making mistakes, in order to be successful, you've got to take risks and that will often lead to making mistakes. I think my main advice on mistakes would be they're going to happen. Be honest about them. Don't try and hide them. Tell your tell your line manager, tell whoever you're working with, you've made that mistake. It can it can always, always be sorted out. It's better to do that than hide it. And then I remember advice my sister-in-law gave me years ago and she said, if you make a mistake, don't worry 
turn it into an opportunity. When you go to the next interview, the, the question you'll be asked is, have you ever made a mistake and what did you do about it? So you're building a bank of examples of where you've made a mistake, what you did to rectify it and how you came out looking better. So that would be my advice on that. OK, uh, on the first one, to build a, a global career or who would you consider as a global academic? I think for, to add to what has just been said, for me, you need uh, to have like a global currency in on your CV. What is it that you are doing that if we give it to somebody that is based in the US, based in Europe, they can say, oh, this person, what this person is doing is quality. If you are doing something that is only recognized in your locality, in your country, I'm afraid it's very difficult to make the case to an international audience that what you're doing is somebody that is elite. So whether we are looking at research, whether we are looking at being able to secure funding from external organizations, are you is your money from a local organization or from UN or World Health Organization? I think those are good indicators that we can look for. And I think if you're a minority, I would say you should devote your time towards things that everybody can recognize, that people, everybody that is assessing your CV, they look at this and say, this is quality. If the, somebody looks at this and say, well, this is local, I'm afraid it's very difficult to make the case to somebody that you are a global academic. And I'm sure uh, in research, everybody knows citation is important. Everybody knows publishing in good journals are important. On the failure side, actually my research is on business failure. So I do study <laughs> quite, quite a lot of uh, uh, failure and, and failure is very, very common. I think one of the issues that we have in many societies, especially in the developing world that I often looked at, is that there's a tendency for people to hide their mistakes. Mm -hmm. There's a tendency yeah. if you're in an organization and you make a mistake, you should try and cover it up. And I think that impedes what we can learn uh, from failure. So there's also, and I think much of the research supports this, that we actually learn more from failures than we do from success. Thank you. I think we yeah. had somebody else. Yeah. Who else? Who else? Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ethan Kuba. Uh, um, my my question is really about um, how to marry um, your industry experience with an academic career because um, I, for one, I originally wanted to be an academic from day one. Um, however, being an African, being Nigerian, my parents were poor. So the first thing they wanted me to do right after my master's was to get married, get a family, give them grandkids first before I have a doctor in the first moment. Um, so I then dab dabbled into the industry and I was there for about 15 years. Um, so for my own career break, I decided to do a PhD, um, which is what I'm currently doing now. So but I, I'm still interested in the um, academic field. But what, that I, what I see, what I get most times is, oh, what paper have you written? Um, written what, what have you written about? What have you talked about? Um, I've worked in the policy space. So most of my papers are policy working papers or maybe a chapter in a book. Um, but I'm just asking because like, how else can I promote myself to say, look, you don't need to start me all the way at the bottom of the, to the ladder of the cater. Um, I would really appreciate if my years of experience are actually taken into consideration. Thank you. So I should caveat this with um, I have no industry experience. Uh, <laughs> I, I came straight from my PhD into a lectureship. What I would say, though, is the type of experience you're um, you're talking about is becoming increasingly valuable and recognised in universities. So Leicester has just introduced or is in the process of introducing in the next week or so um, a teaching and practice career path, which is um, you know, mirrors sort of, some universities have been called professors of practice, which is essentially taking that industry experience and recognizing it and you know what it can bring 
to the university. So um, the school has just made its first two appointments on the teaching and practice career path. We've just hired two lecturers in business and the space economy. And both of those people come from, you know, working with uh, Airbus, um, international um, space groups, and they're bringing their industry experience into the school to benefit our students, to benefit our research, our business engagements. It's, it's a skill that not many academics who have gone through sort of, um, you know, straight undergrad, master's, PhD, lectureship route have, but it's incredibly valuable for us. So don't be afraid of marketing it. I think there's many universities out there that will recognise it and really value it. Yeah, I'd say the same, own it. We've been talking about brand. You're bringing something that's totally different. Um, you've got both things. You've got the industry experience. You've got the academic experience. Don't try to kind of, I'm not suggesting you do it, but don't try to fake the academic experience. You've got the industry experience instead and universities are crying out for it. So I think you, you've got a great brand there. Keep building it. Be proud of it. Or if you want to chat. No, not, nothing else to add. And uh, they made very, very good point. I think a STEM engagement comes in different forms. So some like yourself come from industry. And sometimes also you might get a STEM engagement through your career, through the work that you have done. Yeah. So uh, for instance, I sit on one of the UN panels, not because I kind of worked several years in the industry. It's just that I was doing a lot of research in that particular area and then it, and then that attracted their attention to reach out. So sometimes uh, the number of different pathways to this uh, external engagement. Are we taking more questions? Yeah, do we have any? any yes. OK, any questions in the room? Uh, any other question? All right, you go ahead. Okay. Yes, uh, this is about uh, global opportunity. And I just felt that the context of social media has not been well discussed. So I guess this is a point whereby we want to say, OK, do the journals, things will come. But I think going back to that point about the outreach, the impact of our work, that's what I was asking. Like, if I tell you, you know what, I've got 100 followers on my, on my Twitter. If I tell you, if I share my research with my fans, they will engage more with it than you publishing your three stars. So I think maybe coming back to the university, how would you feel if I come to your interview saying, you know what, no, I don't have four stars, but the three stars, if I put it on my social media, everybody wants to know more about your university. How would you tell a prospective professor who is telling you, I might not have four stars, but I've got millions of followers and they will engage with my research? So what would you say to that? So the question, in case anyone has not heard it, is about how, you, how people who are visible on social media could use that uh, to kind of leverage those who are publishing in three stars and four stars, if anyone wants to add, and then I'll add Maybe something to that. Back. Yeah. Back to yeah, it's a tough question. I think um, I don't really know the answer, and I don't think universities are very good at recognising yet that those academics with or, or academics in the making who've got maybe hundreds of thousands of followers, we're not tapping into it enough. I think the younger generation are tapping into it. They know who the influencers are. And I think as universities, we need to catch up with industry and, and work that out. And maybe it's not always about the four star papers, but um, yeah, we need to change. We need to keep up. The, one point that I will add to this is that if you looked at the ranking of universities, external engagement is one of it. In other words, the visibility of the academics influences people's perception. So let's say you have a million followers and you are based at the University of Leicester, it will influence people that complete this survey, whether they are employers. And also means that the work that maybe the, the way you will package your story is slightly different, that maybe your three star kind of would enhance the university research intensity score. Because if you are three star, let's say they have a thousand citations, that also will impact significantly in terms of how the university is rated globally. So maybe that might be a way you will package your story to, to tell a, a university. Do you want to say something? Oh, I would love to get these answers. <laughs> 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 um, I've actually not got a whole lot to add on this. It's, I think Henrietta hit the nail on the head. It's a really diff difficult issue that I don't think we're good at sort of analysing yet, uh, or we don't have a really good answer. Um, I think we recognise it when people can leverage that, um, those 
connection like we chose follows for something so you know we our promotion pathways our hiring routes have space to recognize um broader uh impact broader uh communication but it's almost it's through let's say the impact of it it's through what we see not just having those connections it's so what did you what did you do with them I think that's a very good question. And I call it and I quote on my, one of my very good quotes. We always, you know, argue about this all the time. So you have, uh, for me, for example, I, I think last time I checked my LinkedIn, I've got 10,000 something followers. Okay, good. One of the ways I use that, for example, at the university is to do outreach events. I go to Nigeria quite a lot. And if I'm there, I'm going to post out, you know, I'm going to be at this hotel, I'm going to be here doing this thing, and people come. But don't let us forget that university is a knowledge driven environment. Of what use, and let's be very critical, of what use is it, is it to have 10,000, 50,000 followers on LinkedIn, but you don't have good research? So let's, don't let us compromise on quality of that. We've got to have good research first that is going on, and then we can then use the followership to sort of complement the research. Either to use it to, you know, get onto the UN, World Economic Forum, whatever. But if you don't have good research, even if you have 10 million followers on LinkedIn, you're just going to be making noise without any substance behind you to back up the noise you're making. So I think there's a balance between that, and that's very important. You can't go on to get, get, get a professorial position and say, oh, I've got 50,000 followers, but I don't have any research. They won't be hired. It's just as simple as that. And I'm not sure if that makes sense. <laughs> My friend just raised the point that if your followers can be converted into admissions. <laughs> it's very true. I mean, we have to ask ourselves at the end of the day, you've got a million followers. I don't be okay. <laughs> I feel like you've said, what's the impact? Earlier on, when we were talking about promotions, we we're talking about quantifying value. Yes. So, what is the value of having a million followers? If the fact that you went to Nigeria, you posted on LinkedIn that you're in, you're in this hotel, you're recruiting, at the end of the day, less than you need to get in an additional 200 students enrolling, that is it. Each student is paying, I don't know what less than you need charges. Let's say 15 grand for three years, that is 45 grand. 20 students work up to the maths. That's not, it's not just about. I'm putting it for me personally, right? I, I mean, I went to Ghana last year and I, I got my first PhD student from Ghana through my um, um, activity there, through my LinkedIn. My second PhD student, where is she? Yeah, in Nigeria, we connected through those activities on LinkedIn. So, so I think it could work in that way where you could you know, use that uh, you know, to recruit. Just to add quickly, you said you went to Nigeria and you posted it on LinkedIn. I think it's only a male that can do that, or females. We can't do that because. You think for saying that you went to a hotel? Oh. Yeah, you to... No, no, no. You don't you tell yourself to any. <laughs> So um we have two questions online. The first is what advice do you have for an academy that has that had a career break for six plus years on projecting their research and career pathway? Then the second one is, my question goes to the female gender, most especially from their direct mentor, either as a student or in a workplace. Has anyone been in a situation where she has been asked out, knowing fully well they are both married? How was it? I'm tired of asking the question. So what's the question? The question says, how? Uh, Question. That's a question. It does sound like a question. The question goes to the female gender, most especially from the direct mentor, either as a student or in the, in the workplace. 
has anyone been involved or been in a situation, sorry, where she has been asked out, knowing fully well they are both married? So this is probably talking about the boundaries between mental and mental relationship. And I think we spoke about that actually in our last event at King's College when we were talking about the fact that there should be a wall between who the mentor is and who the mentee is. But who wants to answer that question? So there were two questions. So should we go to the first question? Do you remember the first question? Uh, the first one is on um, career breaks. Career breaks of six plus years. Six plus years. Do you create a new pathway for? I remember, Elieta, you mentioned you had a career break, so maybe you. Um, yeah, I think it's kind of what we've we've said already, actually. It's making sure that you're getting support from your line manager, from your colleagues to understand how to get back into academia, um, to, to use your networks, to rebuild. It's not easy. Six years is, is quite a long time to be out. But actually, when you come back in, it's thinking about what you've got to offer and how you can how you can rebuild those networks. Yeah, um, I think certainly in the past there is limited funding through certain funding councils to enable that as well. I, I don't dare to report to you like most funding councils, it will be in high demand, but it would certainly be worth looking out. Um, I think importantly having a plan as well, you know, up to six years out, you're going to be, you know, behind is perhaps the wrong word, but you're going to need to, you know, bring yourself up to speed, you know, you won't have that pipeline of paper, so it's setting realistic expectations, what do you need to do for that? So, I can plan for you guys. Uh, in terms of career break, I've not had any, but I will think academia is like a moving escalator. Once you jump off, it's very, very difficult to get back on. Even if you, for me, if I stop doing research, even for two, three months, and I, I want to try and get back, it's very, very difficult. So imagine if somebody's had six, Yes, then it means you have to go and learn new method, new way of writing to try and catch up. And in many cases, you also see that the literature has moved on from what you and that also requires a lot of adjustment to be able to cope. So maybe the collaboration that has been emphasized before might be a useful way forward. Now we have a second question about the um, mentor mentee relationship, how to put the barriers and the boundaries, how to respect that. You have anything there? <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to answer this slightly at a tangent, possibly. I think we have to recognise that academia needs its own Me Too mo moment, really. And I think there's a lot of bad practice that goes on across universities in academia and people don't call it out. And we need to make sure that people feel able to call it out, that women feel supported to do that. Um, I think in terms of mentor-mentee relationships, I was thinking about this earlier today. I think there's still a culture sometimes in universities. I'm being quite brave saying this, possibly. I think there's still a culture of um, in some universities, and I'm not talking about my own university, but there's a culture where often there's still a let's go to the pub. Let, let's, let me, uh, as a, a, a male professor may say to another male professor, let's go out for a meal, let's discuss it. As a woman, it's not easy to do that. You have to think through those situations very, very carefully. And I think the more that we all work together to move away from that culture, um, it, it's a really important thing to happen in academia. I think we're behind the curve. I think there are other sectors where on a daily basis, actually, you see these stories in the news where behaviours are unacceptable and they are being called out. And that would be my advice to the, the question asker is to, um, to, to to speak about it, to talk to somebody you trust. Take, I've taken it quite serious there, but. Um, thank you. I'm just going to add a few, uh, a small thing to, to the question around social media and also to put a spin on something you said about a small project. Sometimes thanks to social media, small projects somewhere local could go very global. We've seen that in terms of even uh, Me Too, in terms of climate activists and small projects. Uh, if uh, if I'll summarise what you said, uh, which was one, uh, you said timing. It's all about timing. Uh, you also said about um, career break, you know, coming back and um, uh, literature has changed. And also remember timing, if you've got to note something on your on your uh, notepad right now. And you said also, kind of, which was about, we talk about media training, brand on it, visibility. So please remember these also, they are keywords to take you up out there for the uh, global profile. And you said something around, 
if you've done a mistake, do not cover it. Especially we are in a world which is very miniature nowadays. If you've done something somewhere, I don't know, like also Niagara or Dubai, wherever you are right now, it will come out at some point in time. Especially when you are up there in globe in the global profile, people will go and find dirt on you. So that's um, been my um, three things. Sum up from the session, and also to add that failures is what you need uh, for quantum leap. So remember to embrace these failures. So thank you very much, actually. If, uh, Can we give them a bit of an To our moderator, to our wonderful speakers, very insightful session. Uh, I hope you were impacted by those insights. You guys sound tired. Thank you so much. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to close up now. We're going to have uh, closing remarks from myself, uh, from the Dean, our host, Professor Daniel Dabi. I'll just say a couple of you know short words about you know the conference. Uh, like I said, the first time we sat together, myself and you know my team, the SDA team, to plan this conference was I think in February or March. So you can imagine it's taken us months and months to plan this. What you see in the room, right? There's a lot of back off work that goes into the plan. Really, I want to dare you to try and organize an event. It's not easy. I mean, I was going through my email trail yesterday. I've got different folders for SDA and this, and I have over 900 emails just to organize this event. So I really, really, really want to tell you that a lot of work has gone into making this day happen. I hope, sincerely do hope that you found it very useful. Going back to my talk earlier about the fact that one of the major for the SBA really is to create this safe space for people to be real, to talk, and to perhaps learn from each other. I hope this was an impactful session for you that it wasn't a waste of your time, but it was something that you might want to use to propel your career further. But you know, as I was saying, planning this session wasn't easy. It wasn't done alone by myself, so I, I don't come here Although, you know, a lot of people have mentioned my name and, they, and, they, and to, be fair, to be fair, sometimes I get tired of that because it is not just me who has planned this. It is not just me who is behind SDA. I've got a team that I work with and I'd like to introduce them to come forward very quickly so that they are recognized, they are known by you guys. Can I have the SDA team members come forward, please? So, our event today uh, was put together by this wonderful team. Very wonderful people. Uh, let me start from my left. My far left is Dr. Bola Babaji. She's a senior lecturer in finance at the Montfort University. She's in charge of our excellent engagements and partnerships. Uh, give, us, give her a round of Manchester University, where she's a lecturer and she's in charge of our education. So she does quite a lot of work with students for SBA. Messi's nickname is the questionnaire. Messi asks so many questions, right? Messi is uh, at the University of at Durham, Durham University, and Messi is our project manager. We do the project. Steve, Steve is from the University of Portsmouth, so he's traveled quite far to join us today. And Steve is our operations manager. He looks after anything that has to do with our operations, particularly for our events. Let's give him up. Sonia, my PhD student, Sonia was uh, our Austrian administrator today. I'm sure many of you saw her as you were coming into the room. She was quite helpful. So, Sonia, thank you very much. I think it's again. Is Probably one of how many PhD students we say to put it. I think I lost one of my PhD students who was also helping out with Austrian today. So one one of them. The last person is my wife. <laughs> yeah, now, she's a legal practitioner, so she's not actually in academia, but she helps me a lot 
with managing some of the compliance stuff that we have to do as an organization like this, uh, particularly with our outreach work. So thank you very much. Let's let me talk a little bit. I'm pretty sure she, she's so glad that this event is finished <laughs> because for the last probably two months, she's not had good sleep. Every single time she's on bed, I kick her on the bed and I wake up 4 a.m. <laughs> right, so I'm really glad that I'm, I'm sure that she, but she's been very supportive. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, you guys can go back now. Thank you very much. Thank you. But I also want to specially recognize, and I really, really mean this from the depth of my heart. You know, Madan was saying earlier, and Arietta was saying earlier, about the key role of professional services. Honestly speaking, I've got to be very honest with you. I never really saw how important professional services are to the university or to the school. Every single thing you see here today, in terms of every little detail, was couldn't have been possible without the professional services staff here, particularly the ULSD events team, and I would really like to recognize them. So please come forward. Have it. Yes. Trust me, I call them the A team. <laughs> These guys are really good. They are, I'm, one, I'm one person that I believe in gratitude. If somebody does something for you, you need to say thank you openly. I'm un unapologetic about this thank you, you guys. Because the since yesterday we've been here setting up and but that's what I'm saying that every single thing you're seeing here started since yesterday. And I'm not gonna forget something. Some of the I'm gonna keep leaving. Some thank you. And, 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 um, um, actually we had uh Tom, we had who's guy we had yesterday. Uh Tom. Tom, no, that's online. Oh, uh, Sunday. Sunday as well. Sunday as well. But what am I saying is that I want to really specially thank you guys for I made many mistakes emailing you different <laughs> things. And you know, as an academic, I'm still a full time academic. Okay? I'm not an events manager. Okay? So I'm still delivering my lectures. I'm still there setting up an assessment. I've got a deadline today to submit my answers from them. That'll be nice. <laughs> but I'm still got my eighty nine job to do. And I really realized that, wow, to organize events, particularly, we've been doing online events. It's our first full-time conference. It is no joke. And that's what I'm saying. I dare you to go and do one. And you realize that, wow. So thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Thank you. So like I said, I hope you had a good time. I will pass on the mic now to Dan, our team, our host for today's conference just to say some final remarks and um, for the day. So that over to you. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to speak for, for, for very long. Um, I'll just tell you what's going on at this point. And Andy Scott's formulates the submissives. The longer I speak, the harder you're going to have the time. <laughs> Assisa, it's been an absolute privilege to host the um, SCA event today. Um, thank you. To, so one of the difficulties of organising an event like this is you can't thank yourself. So it's for me to, to thank Addy for organising this event. You can't tell how much hard work these types of events are, and they're incredibly hard work to put together. And as I say, this isn't something you have to do. This is something that's, something that's Part of his job is something that I'm making him do. I have no part in it. It's something he's chosen to do. He's taken responsibility for because it matters to him. And I think credit is duly deserved. So well done. Thank you very much. Ooh, so, what, what are my final um, um, words, very short words, is that I want you to go away from this event feeling empowered. Right. When I started my PhD at Newcastle University, uh, probably 10 years ago now, we didn't have any black staff or professor, I would say, sorry, I didn't call it professors. I didn't have any mentor to talk to as a young PhD student and say, look, what are you going through? How did you get there? How can I be like you one day? I used to have people that I see from afar, people like Kenneth, 
like Emmanuel and David and so many other people, and I'll just watch their profile. Hmm, I want to be like this person one day, right? So I think it's really nice to have something like this where we could begin to learn. So we don't you don't have to make my mistakes. And you could easily move on to become better academics. So thank you very much for coming. I hope you found it very useful. Our next event will be a small workshop probably in February next year, which will be about mental health. Somebody was taking a joke that many academics are sometimes crazy. <laughs> you know, because of the kind of stress, you know, we deal with we're dealing with five revisions, there are different things going on. So we're going to have a workshop on mental health next year, February or end of January, and we're going to be looking at some of those issues and how can we manage our mental health? Because we have families, we have other things that we do apart from being academics. So look out to that or look out for that. But, uh, we've opened or launched our website, become a member. So just go on there and just it's very quick form for you to really be a member so you can really be part of us. Okay. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.